Hello everybody! My name is Anthony, and in this video, I'll read the original script of A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, by David Chaskin. Or maybe it's Haskin. Um, I apologize to David if you happen to listen to this video and I misread your name. Um, but I think I'm going to use Chaskin. <laughs> um, I'll read the screenplay verbatim, as I did in my first read-through, to keep things educational. I think I'll do this in every screenplay read-through from now on. You will hear audio inconsistencies, but nothing too glaring. You may hear my portable heater in the background, but I prepared captions that you can access on YouTube. I left some mistakes or liberties in, but they shouldn't diminish the overall screenplay. It would read the same even if I were to fix them. I misread Schneider as Snyder only because the name was mistyped several times in the script, but I do believe it's supposed to be Schneider. So, drop in, chill out, and wallow in the melodic modulations of my variably vivacious voice. Begin main title sequence. Exterior, suburban housing development, day. A big yellow school bus pulls up to a corner and discharges a group of teenagers. It's one of those fantastic spring afternoons, and the kids take to their freedom like they were just sprung from Leavenworth. Kids. Good night, Joe. Have a good weekend, etc. The bus driver doesn't answer, but nods and smiles as they deboard. He is a pleasant-looking, elderly man, wearing a khaki work shirt, a matching cap, and chewing on an unlit 25-cent stogie. The doors fold shut, the gears grind, and the bus continues along its route. Interior, school bus, day. While there are only about a dozen kids on the bus, the noise level is deafening. Girls are yapping. Guys are horsing around. Someone is fiddling with a ghetto blaster, trying to decide among several loud stations. Exterior, suburban street, day. The bus turns a corner, taking them out of the development and past some older, less identical looking residences spaced more widely apart. Interior, school bus, day. The driver downshifts the old heap, pulls the wheel over to the curb, and reaches over to push the door lever open. Kids file out down he aisle, or down the aisle, some of them wishing him well as they leave. Another angle. As the gears grind again and the bus pulls away, we see that there are only a few kids remaining. Two girls sit together toward the center, and a lone, nerdy-looking boy sits at the rear. The driver is in front of the aluminum divider and, except for the top of his cap, cannot be seen. End main title sequence. On the three kids, the two girls are pretty, teen fashionable, and just a little immature. One of them turns back to look over her shoulder. Closer angle. The boy. Poor kid, about 17, four eyes, bad skin, lousy posture, and an obvious inferiority complex. And editorial, in case anyone is wondering, um, four eyes basically means uh, glasses. So back in the day when I was in grade school. Um, some kids would sometimes refer to other kids as four eyes, and it basically meant that uh, that kid was referring to a kid who wore glasses, because it wasn't all that cool to wear glasses in grade school back in the 80s. <laughs> He's sweating profusely, and he stands slightly to unlatch and lower the window. He pulls down on it with all his strength, but it is hopelessly stuck. He sits back down and sighs. Suddenly he feels the girls stare. He doesn't turn, but sends his eyes over to see who's goggling at him. On girls, J. 
Jessie's POV, the first girl turns back to her friend to whisper something. The friend turns around to see for herself. Interior, bus. The boy stares forward now and catches her glance directly. The girls shift quickly in their seats to face forward <laughs> or forward and let out with an uncontrollable rush of mean giggles. The boy is clearly embarrassed now and looks down at the books in his lap. We hear the engine revving. The bus seems to be picking up speed. One of the girls stands, ready to get off. Girls POV out window, exterior street. A mother, her preschool child on a tricycle and their dog wait for the bus to discharge the girl. Exterior street. The bus speeds past the waiting group to their amazement. Interior bus. The standing girl's jaw drops open as they shoot by a familiar looking intersection and continue to pick up speed. First girl to her friend. Hey. Calling to driver. Hey, that war our stop. <laughs> The bus turns a sharp corner and the first girl almost falls. The second girl grips onto the seat back and lifts herself to her feet. Second girl, calling to the driver, Hey Joe, our stop! Her POV, the front of the bus. The unseen driver ignores the calls and continues picking up speed. We might notice that his hat has changed. In place of the cap, we can see the top of a battered old fedora. Second girl, off camera. Hey, let us off! Exterior, two-lane street, day. The sky has suddenly turned. A wave of threatening clouds sweeps overhead, and the wind is churning, a planting of roadside, weeping willows into a tangled mess of yellow tendrils. The bus winds near the top end of third. All of its flashers are going like the dashboard was having a major coronary. It passes the last house and heads into open terrain. In the bus, the second girl steps into the aisle and starts making her way toward the front of the coach. Second girl, under her breath. Deaf old fart. <laughs> she stops suddenly and gasps as she watches. The driver's arm emerge to throw the floor shift into fourth. His hand is clad in a strange glove that tip his fingers with a menacing set of razor-sharp steel talons. His sleeve is charred and smoking. The bus swerves wildly as it skids around a corner, throwing its few passengers into collision courses with the walls and each other. A flash of lightning crashes through the air. Exterior, desert, landscape. As the lightning subsides, the sky is dark. The bus screams along, banging through rocks and ditches, crashing through a wall of overgrown brambles. Thick clouds of steam pour out from under he hood and stream back along toward the rear of the vehicle. On the boy. Holding O to his seat back and watching out the window in terror as trees tear loose from the ground, I, the buses wake. Okay, so I guess it's supposed to say, holding on to his seat back and watching out the window in terror as trees loosen from the ground in the buses wake. We hear a loud rumbling, and the bus begins to shake as if the planet itself is splitting in two, on the bus. Skinning across the desert landscape, being thrown to and fro, laterally, at the mercy of the shuddering landscape. On a front wheel, as the tire smacks into a jagged boulder, snapping the wheel from its axle. On the front end. Bouncing to a violent halt, the bumper digging a long trench into the earth. In the bus. The kids pick themselves up from the floor, 
It is very hot and smoky inside. They have moved closer together now, sweating, scared. Frantically, the boy tries to open a window, but it will not budge. He looks out the window and gasps. Exterior, POV from window. The ground below begins to split apart and tumble into a deep fissure that is encircling the bus. On the moor, the bus center, the land is imploding all around it. Huge chunks of the earth's crust are shearing themselves loose from the edges of the fissure and tumbling into oblivion. In moments, the bus is stranded on the narrow tip of a towering ridge of crumbling stone. The bus teeters precariously, tasting the smoky abyss in every direction. Inside, the second girl is on all fours in the aisle. She looks up toward the driver's seat. Second girl, seeing something hideous. Jesus! She scrambles to her feet and begins backing off. The floor of the bus shifts dangerously, throwing the girl into the edge of one of the seats. On the driver, as he makes his way toward the back. We don't see his face, but he is dressed in a filthy green and red sweater. In the background, the dashboard instruments are sparking and sending thick black fumes toward the ceiling. Smoke is rising off his body as if he just stepped out of some horrible fire. A small patch of skin on his hand sizzles and pops and drips a molten glob of flesh that burns a small hole in a seat cushion. His razor talons sweep along the tops of the seat backs, cutting deep gashes into the green vinyl upholstery and scraping horribly over the tubular steel support poles. On the boy, terrified, looking first at the awful talons, then out the window at the deadly drop and back at the bus driver. On the girls, sweating, panicking, they back away, going from window to window, trying desperately to pull them down. They're all locked tight. One reaches for the emergence door rear at the rear of the bus. It comes off in her hand. The kids huddle together, petrified, screaming, as the driver is upon her. Close up, driver. He lifts the awful talon glove in foreground. Behind, obscured by smoke, we see, for an instant, his face, the face of Freddy. He raises his weapon arm higher and strikes. Smash cut to interior, Walsh House, kitchen, morning. Close on a steel blade cutting into red flesh. We pull back and see that it is Mom slicing a tomato at the kitchen counter. This is an all-American family, along with a mom, there's a dad, and a kid sister named Angela. And they are all having breakfast together. A moment later, there is a muffled, off-camera scream. Mom looks up. We can also make out the ringing of an alarm clock in another part of the house. Angela jumps slightly at the scream. She's a pretty little 11-year-old, genuinely cute, not precocious. Angela, to Mom. Why can't Jesse wake up like everybody else? Mom, hushed. Shh. He must have had another nightmare. Cut to interior, Walsh House, Jesse's room, morning. On Jesse's bed, an alarm clock rings loudly. Jesse Walsh, 17, is sitting up in bed. He's sweaty and scared and disoriented as he slams his hand down on the alarm and tries to shake the nightmare out of his head. We see that he's the boy on the bus, only he's not half bad looking, far from nerdy. He has no skin problems, and he doesn't wear glasses, and his body is in good shape. As he gets out of bed, still shaky from the dream, and we see that his bedroom is littered with cardboard cartons, most of them open and half empty, 
He trips over a carton on his way to his jeans. Interior, Walsh House, Kitchen, Morning. Mom is at the stove cooking eggs for her family. She looks up, worried, as Jesse comes in and heads for the refrigerator. Jesse mumbles, Morning. Mom, putting on a smile, Morning, honey. Jesse pours himself a glass of milk from the fridge. He joins Dad and Angela family at the breakfast table. Dad, you got your room straightened out yet? Jesse yawns. It's getting there. Dad, we've only been living here six weeks now. I want that room unpacked by tonight. Mom comes over with some eggs for Dad. Mom to Jesse. Want some eggs? Angela, what are you doing? On Angela. She is struggling to put her hand deep into a box of Fu Manchu's breakfast cereal. Angela, frustrated. I'm trying to get to Fu Man fingers. Printed on the box is a cartoon caricature of the Oriental doctor pointing to a bowl of his product with one of his long, sharp fingernails. There's a burst above the product name that reads, Free Inside, Fu Man Fingers, and shows a drawing of a hand wearing several extra long, red plastic fingernails on its fingertips. Mom lets Angela go on with her search and turns back to Jesse, waiting for his answer. Mom. Jess? Jesse. Uh-huh. Mom. Eggs? Jesse rubs his temples. He was away for a minute, but he's back now. Jesse. Oh, uh, no, just some milk, Mom. Mom. You okay? Dad eyes him suspiciously. Jesse. Yeah, I'm fine. Just really hot upstairs. Mom nods. I know it's warm. To Dad. I wish you'd call someone to check out the air conditioning, Ken. Dad, defensively. I know what's wrong with the air conditioning. Just needs a shot of Freon, is all. Jesse. Dad's fixing something again? Hit the deck. Dad. Don't be a smartass. A short silence as they all look back to their place. Mom, to Jesse. So, school going all right? Jesse shrugs. Okay, I guess. Mom, making friends? Jesse is looking around for some escape. This interrogation is getting a little too personal. Jesse, yeah, you know how it is. On Angela, she grabs onto the prize at the bottom of the box and gives a yank. A bag full of Fu Man fingers come out in her hand along with half the box of cereal. Sound over, doorbell ringing. Mom turns to answer the door, but Jesse immediately jumps up and cuts her off. Jesse, that's Lisa. I gotta get to school. Dad calling after him. Who's Lisa? But Jesse is gone. Just a kitchen door swinging in his wake. Interior, Walsh House, foyer, day. As Jesse opens the front door to Lisa Paletti, 17, she is facing the street and she turns around when she hears the door open. Not a knockout, but real pretty, with an intelligence and sweetness about her. She is truly lovely. Lisa. Hi. She smiles and Jesse's eyes light up. Exterior, Walsh House, day. They walk to Jesse's car, a beat up blue falcon parked curbside. Jesse, gratefully. Your timing was perfect. I was getting the third degree in there. Lisa, how come? Jesse, ah, uh, nothing. Jessie opens Lisa's car door for her. She steps in and sits down. In the car. The interior is worse than the body. 
The upholstery is torn to shreds. The dashboard is cracked and peeling, and there's a big hole where the radio used to be. A cheap AM transistor radio hangs by its wrist strap from the rearview mirror. Jesse hops in and shifts around to get comfortable and reaches under the dash to pull out a couple of bare wires. Lisa watches him routinely twist the wires together, amused. Lisa, aren't you afraid somebody could steal your car like that? Jesse, preposterously, look at this car. Are you kidding? He sits up again and reaches for a toggle switch that has been crudely drilled into the dash. He flicks the switch. Jesse moves his finger to another alien button in the dash and pushes it. The starter turns over slowly. The engine backfires and the car starts noisily. Jesse gives her the thumbs up as if he were a World War I ace and puts the car into gear. It bucks and farts and rumbles up the street. <laughs> Exterior, pool, rear, Walsh house, day. Dad floats on a foam chair in the middle of the rather rundown pool, sipping coffee from a mug bearing the word Dad. He looks over his domain with satisfaction and inhales a deep breath of fresh suburban sir. <laughs> fresh suburban air. Mom comes out the back door. And she looks just a bit worried. Mom, Ken, shouldn't you be getting to the office? It's almost nine. Ken, as soon as I finish my coffee, I'm enjoying my pool right now sips his coffee. I love our new house, don't you? Mom sighs heavily. Of course I do, Ken. Ken, what's the problem, Cheryl? Mom, pointing behind her. It's just I'll be a lot happier when you finish taking down those bars. Camera pans up and zooms in to reveal bars on the upper windows. This is the old Thompson house, replete with the security paraphernalia that kept Nancy Thompson prisoner five years prior. Mom, off camera, people that lived here before must have been truly paranoid. Exterior, high school, day. Establishing shot of school, shot from parking lot with Jesse's car in foreground. School is in session, so the only students we see are two class cutters leaning against a car passing a joint. Exterior, height school practice field day. <laughs> An intramural softball game is in progress. Coach Snyder, a nasty looking ex-marine, stands behind home plate as an umpire. Jesse is covering second base. Ronnie Grady, a tough-looking wise-ass type, steps up to the plate. He knocks the mud off his sneakers with his bat and takes his stance. On Jesse, he glances over to the adjacent field. His POV. The girls are in the middle of archery instruction. Lisa is there, mighty tempting-looking in her little powder-blue gym suit. A quiver strapped to her shoulder and a longbow in her hand. Carrie, a dizzy Bloomingdale's punk, steps up alongside Lisa as the latter catches Jesse's stare. Schneider, off camera, strike! Carrie to Lisa, re Jesse, whatever that means. <laughs> it says to Lisa, comma, R E Jesse. Uh, so, to Lisa about Jesse? To Lisa in lieu of Jesse? Eh. He made any moves yet? Lisa smiles and waves to Jesse. Lisa, aside to Carrie, I only know him a few weeks, Carrie. On Jesse, he waves back. Back to Lisa and Carrie. Carrie, I think he needs a push start. 
Lisa turns to face the target, slides an arrow into the knocking point, draws back the bowstring, and lets the arrow go. On the target. It's a bullseye. Crack. Grady gets hold of a perfect pitch and sends it flying over the head of the pitcher. Back to Jesse. Boom. The ball skids off the side of his head and the kid collapses. His teammates rush to his side and help Jesse to his feet. He's more embarrassed than hurt and he waves away any overattention. Coach Snyder joins the circle of bodies around him. Snyder, you okay? Jesse, yeah, I'm fine. Snyder, walking away. Well, pay attention next time. Jesse retakes his position on the base. Grady, off camera. Maybe you ought to try something a little more your speed, Walsh, like knitting. Jesse just now realizes that it was Grady who scored a double off his call. He's standing just off the bag, harassing Jesse while waiting to be hit home. Jesse, flipping him the bird. Knit this, Grady. Grady sneers and gives him the jack-off sign. Jesse tosses an Italian salute, slapping one hand into the crook of his arm and throwing up the finger for good measure. Grady grabs his own crotch and points to it obscenely. On the pitcher, he sends one over the plate. The batter catches it dead center and pounds it back to left field. Grady makes a break for third, only to be forced back by the left fielder tossing the ball to the third baseman. On Jesse, his glove up to receive the throw as Grady steams towards him. The ball snaps into Jesse's mitt and Grady turns on his ankles to shoot back to third. Jesse and the third baseman toss the ball between, each time moving closer in toward Grady. Grady switches directions with the ball, trapped between them. Grady dives into a head-first slide, trying to sneak past Jesse. Jesse swoops down and tags him out. Thoroughly aggravated, Grady rises to his feet by reaching out and grabbing onto Jesse's gym shorts and yanking them down to his ankles, revealing Jesse's bare buns and a jockstrap to the world. Jesse lunges for Grady, trips over his shorts, and the two of them begin rolling around in the dirt, duking it out. On the girls in the next field, watching the wrestling match with amusement. On Lisa and Carrie, Lisa tries like hell to repress some laughter. Carrie, cut ass. But I've seen the movie, so I think she means to say cute ass. On Schneider, pushing his way through a crowd of laughing, cheering spectators and jumping in to break up the scuffle, he lifts both boys up by their necks. Schneider, okay boys, assume the position. Interior, coach's office, day. Schneider is at his desk. Two boys carrying gym bags pass outside the coach's office. They wave to him through the wire glass windows. Boys, night coach. Schneider gives them a cold glance. He checks his watch, gets up and goes to a window to look outside. His POV, the practice field. Jesse and Grady side by side in the center of the baseball diamond. They are in front leaning rest position, the cruel and painful frozen push up that ends halfway to the ground with elbows bent. We don't know how long they've been out there, but it's probably hours. It seems just a little darker out and a lonely wind is blowing around their arms and legs. In the background, kids are filing out of the building. Some stop or stop to look out at the two boys, point and snicker. Angle. We see Lisa among the kids. She stops for a moment and views the scene with concern. On Jesse and Grady. They are dirty, 
Their shirts are ripped, and Jesse has a tiny bruise over his cheek. And they are tired, too. The muscles in their arms are twitching convulsively, and they talk to each other between groans and through teeth clenched with pain. We hear the off-camera sound of several buses pulling out. Jesse, how much longer you figure he'll keep us out here? Grady, could be all night, nodding in the coach's direction. Guy gets his rocks off like this. Hangs out in queer S&M joints downtown. Likes pretty boys like you. Jesse, get out of here. <laughs> Grady doesn't pursue it. Instead, he looks around and tries to think of some small talk. Grady, finally. So what about you and that Politi girl? Jesse, what about it? Grady, you two got the thing going or what? Jesse, She's a neighbor. I drive her to school. Grady. She giving you any car fare for the ride? Jesse. You got a problem with me, Grady. Grady. Shrugs. Nah. Just killing time? Sound over. A whistle blowing. On the coach. Dressed in his street clothes. Crossing the field toward the faculty parking lot. He pulls the whistle from his mouth. Schneider to the boys. Okay, boys, hit the showers. Interior, boys' locker room, day. Jesse and Grady stand at opposite ends of a row of lockers and change into their street clothes. Their movements are slow and cumbersome, like a pair of creaky old men. Grady, finally. So you live around here? Jesse sighs warily. Not too far. My folks bought a place over on Elm Street. Grady stops buttoning his shirt and looks up at Jesse. Grady. Elm Street? You telling me you moved into that big white house with the bars on the windows? Jesse. Yeah. Why? Grady shakes his head and tucks his shirt tails in. Grady. Shit, you can tell your old man he's a real chump. Jesse, what the hell are you talking about? Grady, they've only been trying to unload that dump for five years. That place is bad news. Some chick got locked in there by her mother and she went crazy. She watched her boyfriend get butchered by some maniac in the house across the street. Her poor drunken mama took her own life right inside your front door. Jesse stares dubiously at Grady. Jesse, with a nervous laugh. You're full of shit. Jesse pulls his knapsack from the locker's shelf, slams the door shut, and walks away. On Grady, he smiles mischievously and shuts his own locker door. Exterior, school parking lot, day. Jesse's car is parked among a handful of others. Lisa leans against a front fender. Waiting patiently. Her POV. Jesse steps out of the building and spots her. He hurries across the lot. On Lisa, as Jesse approaches. Jesse, surprised to see her. Hi! You didn't have to wait. Lisa. That's okay. I wanted to. He raises an eyebrow as he opens the door for her. He likes that. Another angle, as Jesse slides in beside her and starts the engine. She looks him over. He looks like he's been through the mill a couple of times. Lisa, you okay? Jesse, yeah, yeah, sure. Lisa, let me look at your eye. Jesse lifts his chin to show off the tiny bruise over his cheekbone. He looks almost a little proud of it, like it's an old war wound. Lisa touches it tenderly. Lisa, you shouldn't be fighting with that jerk. Jesse, who, Grady? Grady's alright. He's just a hothead. 
Lisa, you mean a shithead. Jesse laughs. Yeah. He guns the engine and they pull away. Exterior, Walsh House, Establishing Shot, Night. It's very late. The house is dark and even the crickets have hit the sack. Hmm. Interior, Jesse's bedroom, night. Jesse's having trouble sleeping. He turns over on different sides and punches up his pillow a couple of times, stares into space, and finally sits up. He gets out of bed, pulls on a pair of pants, and exits. Kitchen. He enters. The room is lit only by the glow of a three-quarter moon. He regains his composure and steps over to the sink to pull off an absurd length of paper toweling. We see it just when Jesse does. A grotesque face has been peering into the window all this time. It disappears from view on Jesse's double take. Jesse stops for a moment to slow down his heart. He takes a deep breath and steps up to the back door. He opens the door. Exterior, side of Walsh House, night. Jesse opens the gate and enters. It is really quiet, not even night sounds. He strains to see past the shrubbery that surrounds the house. Jesse, hoarse whisper. Grady? He looks around. Jesse, it better be you, you son of a bitch. We hear an awful sound from somewhere, wood ripping. Jesse makes his way cautiously along the side of the house. He notices a red-orange light is flickering from behind a cellar window. He gets down on his hands and knees to investigate. The cellar, his POV, an intruder is bent over by the furnace, lit only by a raging fire in the firebox. He puts his hand right into the flames and begins digging for something way in the back of the furnace. We can't see his face, but he is dressed in a filthy green and red striped sweater and a battered hat. He pulls out a bundle of rags, sets it on top of the furnace, and proceeds to unwrap it. On Jesse. Jesse, petrified. Holy shit. He stands up and looks around frantically. He doesn't know what to do. Jesse, near tears. Holy shit. He hurries out the gate that leads to the front of the house. Interior, Walsh House, night. Jesse enters the house and scans the foyer. He heads toward the cellar door. It is a jar. The lock has been splintered as if by a huge wrecking bar, and we can hear the roar of the furnace from below. He sticks his head inside the cellar door and peeks down. His POV, the shadow of a figure, movement on the cellar walls. On Jesse, breathing heavily, brain whirring. Slam! <laughs> He pulls the basement door closed and holds it shut tight, practically hyperventilating. Jesse, screaming. Dad! He looks around frantically. Jesse. Dad! Something inside starts to pull the cellar door open. Jesse tries to hold it shut, but the inexorable force continues to inch it open. Jesse lets go and bolts toward the foyer. Freddy is standing in his path, a sick smile on his scarred face. He flashes his razor knives at Jesse. Freddy, sinisterly, Daddy can't help you now. Jesse tries to make a break for it, but Freddy is too fast. His untaloned hand gets an iron grip on Jesse's shirt collar. Freddy, I've been waiting five years for you, Jesse. We got special work to do, you and me. Things are really gonna heat up. Jesse struggles to get free. Freddy tightens his iron grip 
and fans his talons threateningly. Jesse's head stretches back from the chalking pain. Freddy, we'll do real good together, you and me. Freddy hurls Jesse against the wall. Freddy, you got the body. Doffs his hat. I got the brains. With that, Freddy removes his hat. There is no skull under there, just a pulsating mass of bloody brain matter. Jesse lets out an agonized scream. Cut to interior, Jesse's bedroom, night. On Jesse, still in bed, but his entire body arched backwards over the mattress. His scream continues until he collapses back down into the sheets. On the door. It flies open and Dad crashes into the room, followed by Mom. They go to his bedside and stare at him as he pants and coughs his way back to consciousness. Mom, to Dad. Maybe we should call a doctor. Jesse. No. I'm okay. He sits up to prove it. Jesse. Really. Just a bad dream. Interior. High school biology classroom, day. A rather bored looking group of students is listening with little interest to the droning of their teacher, Mr. Abel, <laughs> who is lecturing them from the front of the room. Mr. Abel. So to review the solid waste, those nutrients that are not absorbed in the lining of the stomach, the large intestine, the small intestine, the alimentary canal are passed out through the colon. Sound over, a fake fart. <laughs> Laughter from the class. Abel looks up crossly from his notes until the laughs trail off. Mr. Abel, off camera, continues. The liquid nutrients are then carried through an elaborate system of filtering, aided by the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. Two girls at the back of the room look at each other. One puts her finger in her mouth and pretends to gag. As Abel drones on in the background, we are on Jesse. He's having a hell of a time keeping his eyes open. His head bobs intermittently as he starts to nod off. On Grady, he nudges a classmate at the next desk to look over toward Jesse. They snicker. On Jesse, their POV, nodding out. Back to Abel, Mr. Abel, or collected in the bladder to be expelled at a later time. And this entire process is kept moving through the circulatory system, the center of which is a beat the heart. On the beat, he reaches under his lab table and plucks a bloody calf's heart down right in the center of it. We hear disgusted groans from the class. Mr. Abel. Four chambers, just like the human heart, really. Abel describes the path by sticking his index finger into each orifice. Hmm. Mr. Abel. From the body, to the right auricle, to the right ventricle, and out the pulmonary artery to the lungs. Back to Jesse, asleep. A particularly ugly and ferocious looking snake is wrapping itself around his arm, making its way toward Jesse's face. Close on Jesse. As he wakes up slowly and looks down groggily toward his arm, the snake opens wide and emits a long demonic hiss. Jesse screams and hastily begins pulling the reptile away from him. On Abel, standing next to Jesse, he pulls the snake off his arm and drops it into a nearby tank. Mr. Abel, if you want to play with animals, Mr. Walsh, join the circus. Guffaws from the class. Jesse looks around, bewildered and embarrassed. He spots Grady, grinning widely. Interior, the Walsh house, living room, early evening. 
comfortable and very suburban. A major colored TV takes up the wall opposite a pair of his and her spark loungers. Dad is watching the 6 o'clock news on the tube and fanning himself with a TV guide. Mom sits on the couch with Angela, helping her with a jigsaw puzzle. Two parakeets are fluttering around inside a cage near the entry into the dining room. Jesse bounces down the stairway, a rolled towel tucked under his arm. Dad stares at him angrily, then turns back to the game. Jesse crosses in front of the set on his way out of the room. Dad, where are you going? Jesse, just out for a while. Dad, shaking his head. I told you I want that room unpacked. Jesse, begging. Oh, come on, Dad. Dad, nope. Pointing toward the stairway. Upstairs. Jesse's about to protest, but Dad cuts him off. Dad, firmly. Now. Jesse turns around, mumbles something under his breath, and stomps back upstairs. Stomp, stomp, stomp. <laughs> Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside, early evening. A pair of glass sliders lead from the house onto a stretch of patio that surrounds a gorgeous built-in swimming pool. The patio is dotted with all the amenities of backyard recreation. A gas barbecue grill, a wet bar, plenty of pipe furniture, and even a pair of freestanding cabanas. The entire setup is contained by a six-foot chain-link security fence. Lisa steps out of the cabana, wearing a swimsuit. She tosses her towel onto a nearby chair and crosses to the diving board. On the board. She bounces lightly and jumps off, cutting gracefully through the water and coming up in the center of the pool. Mrs. Paletti, a pleasant-looking woman in her late 40s, slides open the patio doors and pokes her head out. Mrs. Paletti, calling. There's a Jessie on the phone. Lisa, off camera. Okay, thanks. Lisa swims to the edge of the pool and hoists herself up. She throws the towel over her shoulders and picks up a wireless phone from a low table. Lisa. Jesse? Hi. A beat. Disappointed. Oh, that's okay. Sorry you can't make it. A beat. No, I understand. Parents can be real pains. I'll see you in the morning, then. She hangs up and frowns. Interior, Walsh House, Jesse's room, night. Jesse stands at the foot of the bed, surveying the job unhappily and trying to figure out where to start. Finally, he pulls a shoebox from inside a larger carton, places it on his desk, and lifts the lid. It's full of cassette tapes. He rifles through them, selecting one and popping it into a portable cassette player on the desk. He pushes the play button. The tape is rock and roll. The music gets him moving a bit. He surveys the room, then goes to a carton near the bookshelves. He reaches deep inside the near empty carton and pulls out a stack of books, which he plops on the shelves next to other books already unpacked. He tosses the carton aside. He's getting into the music now as he spins around to face the bureau. He opens a small pox on the bureau while bebopping along and pulls out a pair of sunglasses which he puts on, practically dancing. He dumps the contents of the box haphazardly into a bureau drawer. Jesse opens a large bureau drawer. He grabs a nearby box and dumps it into the large drawer, smoothing it over perfunctorily with his hands. A Stetson cowboy hat is on top. He drops it on his head and pulls it down low over his eyes. On a full-length mirror, Jesse steps into frame to get a look at himself. 
He likes what he sees as he mimes a guitar riff along with the music. In one smooth move, in rhythm with the music, he sings. Ah. He S E I N G S. So, yeah, he sings around and moves to the desk. He, uh, I don't know. He dumps a small box of pencils and supplies into the desk drawer. As an afterthought, he grabs a couple of pencils out of the drawer and drums a few beats on the desk with them. <laughs> he shoves the pencils up his nostrils, tucks his thumbs under his armpits, and waves his elbows like he's doing the funky chicken. Yeesh. <laughs> S silly stuff that one would only do behind closed doors. I don't even think anybody would do the funky chicken behind closed doors. <laughs> I, I don't even think anyone would do the funky chicken behind closed doors. <laughs> it's like, funky chicken. <laughs> now I know why Mark Patton really didn't want to do that scene. Uh, you know, so many, you know, so many people give, uh, Nightmare 2 a hard time because of that dancing scene, but just imagine how bad the movie would be if he did the Funky Chicken. At least Mark Patton didn't do that. At least he did a dance that, you know, wasn't all that embarrassing. He spins around, throwing his arms out and stopping dead in his tracks. His POV... Lisa and Mom are standing in his doorway. Mom looks horrified. Lisa represses a giggle. <laughs> Mom reaches over and knocks timidly on the open door. Jesse hastily pulls the pencils out of his nose and dives for the stereo to turn it off. Beat red, he tosses the hat and sunglasses onto the bed and tries to look nonchalant. Jesse, embarrassed. Hi. Jesse looks to Mom, who takes the hint and turns to leave. Lisa takes a step into the room. Lisa, when Mom is out of range. I told her you invited me over. I guess I should have called, huh? Behind the embarrassment, he's glad to see her. He puts the pencils in the desk drawer and shuts it. Jesse. No, that's okay. I was just unpacking. Lisa. I know. <laughs> Lisa casually steps over to a carton and peeks in. Lisa. I figured you might like some help. Jesse, pleasantly surprised. Yeah? Jesse's room. Later. The room is shaping up nicely, with only a few boxes remaining. Jesse pulls a bundle wrapped in newspapers from a carton. He tears away the paper, revealing a baseball trophy. He places it on a conspicuous corner of his dresser. Lisa reaches into the box, retrieves an aerosol can, and looks at it. On the can, a medicated spray for jock itch. Lisa, off camera. Where does this go? Jessie grabs the can from her hand and puts it down on the dresser behind the trophy. Jessie, mortified. There's a box of sweaters over there if you want to put them up in the closet. Lisa is anxious to pitch in. She nods good-naturedly and steps over to her assignment. Cut to inside the closet. As Lisa opens the door and pulls an overhead chain to switch on the light. Another angle. As she drags a chair over, lifts a pile of sweaters from an open box, steps up on the chair and stacks them on a shelf. She starts to step back down when something catches her attention in the back corner of the shelf. She reaches in and pulls out a small red leather bound book. Lisa. What's this? Jesse steps over to look at it. On the book, 
about two-thirds the size of an average paperback. It has a matching leather thong that snaps into a small latch on the front and opens the book. Lisa, reading, Nancy Thompson, 1428 Elm, looking up at him, Hey, this thing is five years old. Jessie steps over and looks over her shoulder. Jessie, you know her? Lisa, shaking her head. Uh-uh. Before my time. She turns a few pages. Lisa, reading. February 17th, my birthday. Daddy came by today with a big old stuffed bear for me. He took me to dinner and a movie, and when we got back, he and Mother had another one of their fights. He left angry. I wish they would stop fighting. Jesse waves the diary away, uninterested. He crosses back to continue unpacking. Lisa, I think it's sad. Jesse, cynically, traumas of a ten-year-old. Lisa leafs through a few more pages, stops and begins reading with widening eyes. She glances at Jesse and smiles impishly. Lisa, reading, March 7th, Glenn asked me to sleep with him again. I can't yet. I like him. I want to make him happy, but I'm not sure that I love him. I can't sleep with someone I don't love. Jesse, that's typical. I hope she didn't expect to make the bestseller list with this thing. Lisa ignores him and scans the page. Lisa, finding something. Wow, listen to this. Reading. Sometimes, when I'm lying here in bed, I can see Glenn in his window across the way, getting ready for bed. His body is slim and smooth, and I know I shouldn't watch, but that part of me that wants him forces me to. That's when I weaken. That's when I want to go to him. Jesse is suddenly interested. <laughs> I hear you, Jesse. I'm kind of interested, too. Glenn was hot. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, back to the script. He walks over and Lisa hands him in the diary with the page open to that entry. He reads it and quickly turns the page. He frowns and turns another, then another. Jesse, that's it? <laughs> another couple of pages. Wait, she skipped a week. Reading, March 15th. He comes to me at night. Horrible. Ugly, dirty, under the cheats with me, tearing at my nightgown with a steel claw. Jesse's voice trails off on claw, and a chill of vague recognition goes through him. He checks the cover of the book and flips back a few pages. Lisa moves closer to read over his shoulder. Jesse composes himself and looks back at the book. Jesse, reading. His name is Fred and he keeps taking me to the boiler room. He wants to kill me. Jesse almost shivers. He turns to Paige and he freezes. Lisa, what is it? On the diary, Jesse shows her the page. There is one sentence scrawled across the next entry. Lisa reads it. Lisa, Tina is dead? On Jesse and Lisa, they look at each other, spooked. He turns the page. Jesse, reading. Rod's been killed? He got Rod. Just Glenn and me now. Can't fall asleep. Lisa, wow. Jesse's face turns ashen as he looks up at Lisa. Lisa, are you okay? Jesse, nodding covering. Something Grady told me today about the people that lived here last. A girl went crazy, saw her boyfriend killed in the house across the street. He is interrupted by mom, poking her head into the room. Mom, cheerfully, how's it going? Jesse instinctively hides the diary behind his back. Jesse, okay. She looks over the room, 
impressed at the progress. Mom. Looks great. Thought you might want to take a break. Got some cold cider downstairs. Jesse looks at Lisa to see what she wants to do. Lisa looks over at Jesse's alarm clock. The time is 8 p.m. Lisa, standing up. No, thanks. I better get back. To Jesse. Got a major paper due the end of this week. Mom, ducking back out. Well, it's there if you change your mind. Jesse waits for her to leave. Jesse, to Lisa. Are you sure? Lisa nods sourly. World history, brightening. But I'll see you in the morning, right? Jesse nods. Lisa, pointing to the diary. Hot stuff. Let me know how it turns out. Jesse opens the door for her. Jesse. I'll walk you downstairs. Interior, wash house, living room, night. Mom wraps the night cover over the birdcage. She steps past Angela on the couch and crosses in front of Dad in his recliver, <laughs> vegetating in front of the tube. She sits and loosens her collar a bit. On Dad. He shifts uncomfortably and wipes some beaded sweat from his upper lip. Mom to Dad. A little warm in here, huh? Dad gets up from his chair. His shirt is sticky with perspiration. Jesse steps in from the dining room, a glass of milk in his hand. On Angela, looking up at Jesse, she puts a finger to her lips. Angela. Shh, the birds are sleeping. Jesse notices the intense heat in the room immediately. His eyes widen portentously. I, I don't know what that's supposed to be. Pretentious? His eyes widen pretentiously. Does that even make sense? Yeah, I guess it does. On Dad. At the thermostat, Dad, astounded, it's 97 degrees in here. He pulls off the cover plate and starts fiddling with the coil. Suddenly, a loud squawk from the other side of the room makes everyone look up. Jesse puts his milk down on he TV and hurries over to the cage, ripping the cover away. On the birdcage, another series of horrible cries as one of the budgies proceeds to rip up the neck of the other one with his sharp beak. Longer angle, Jesse throws open the door and tries to pull the attacking bird off his victim. The vicious one continues the rapid attacks on Jesse's hand, drawing blood. As Jesse pulls his arm out, the bird flies out into the living room, roaring a repetitive war cry that is eerie and unnatural for something that size. Mom and Dad jump to their feet. Angela starts screaming at the top of her lungs. On the bird, it circles around the ceiling and then dives for Dad, cutting a deep gash under his eye. It seems much larger than it was before maybe twice its original size. Dad, screaming, Get a broom or something! Angle, living room. Mom dashes out of the room. The bird swoops down, heading for Angela, but crashing into the shade of a table lamp, knocking it to the floor. It flutters to the ceiling and hovers near a light fixture. Its beak and most of its head is covered in blood and it opens its mouth to emit a guttural growl. Mom returns with a broom and hands it to Dad. As Dad approaches and lifts the broom to his shoulder, the bird screams again and dives for Jesse. Jesse throws his arm out to block the attack. The bird reverses direction and Dad swings in midair with the broom. He misses, demolishing the remaining table lamp instead on the bird. It hovers again in the air, seemingly without any means of support, puffing up, growing angrier, more demonic, 
then, just as it seems ready for a last lethal attack, there is a loud bang and the bird literally explodes into flames in mid-air. <laughs> The family, <laughs> the family looks at one another in horror and disbelief. The only sound in the room is Angela, attached to her mother's leg and whimpering quietly. Interior, Walsh House, kitchen, night. Crash! Dad dumps an odd assortment of home Handyman tools, I'm assuming that's supposed to be H A N D Y A N, on the kitchen table. He picks through them, selecting a pipe wrench and a screwdriver. He crosses to the stove. We see Mom in the background, standing, not quite cowering, still in shock from the bird attack. Jesse is leaning on the counter, next to the range, watching his father's determined moves. Dad leans into the appliance and attempts to pull it away from the wall, probably tearing six or seven ligaments in the process. After several tries, he stops and looks up at his son. Dad. Help me with this thing. Jesse. It's not the gas, Dad. Dad, angrily, don't tell me it's not the gas. He yanks on the stove with more vehemence. Dad, don't tell me it's not the gas. Your mother thought she smelled gas. Mom, timidly, I wasn't sure again. Dad, to Mom, all right then, what is it? Bird rabies? That cheap seed you've been buying? Mom, resenting that. Oh, please. Dad. What is it, then? There's got to be an explanation. Animals just don't burst in the flames for no reason. Jesse. Well, it sure isn't leaky gas pipes. Dad stands up suddenly, cracking his head on the edge of the range hood. <clears throat> Mom, concerned. Ken! As he groans in pain, he's suddenly hit with a revelation. He points an accusatory finger at Jesse. Dad, you set this all up, didn't you? One of your sick jokes. Jesse, what are you talking about? Dad, you know what I'm talking about. What do you use? A firecracker? A cherry bomb? Jesse is angry now. Jesse, I don't have to listen to this. He storms out of the kitchen. Dad, Come back here. Mom, upset. Ken. Dad looks blankly at the wrench in his trembling hand. Dad. I don't know. I don't know, Cheryl. He used to be a good kid. Cut to exterior. Jesse's house. Night. Dark again. Sleeping soundly. Interior. Walsh home. Second floor hallway. Night. Jesse emerges from his room and eases the door shut as quietly as possible. He stops to listen for any signs of his parents being awake. Sound over. Snores from behind their bedroom door. He steps slightly past their room and toward the head of the stairs. We follow Jesse as he descends the stairs into the darkened foyer. The cellar door. Jesse stops there momentarily losing his nerve. He finally turns the knob and opens the door. Interior, Walsh home, cellar, night. Jesse pulls an overhead chain, flooding the cellar with light. It's just as he saw it in his dream, but devoid of any intruders. He steps up the, the furnace, <laughs> squats down and opens the firebox door. He reaches in, to his horror, he feels something and pulls out an object, wrapped in rags. On the object, as he unwraps it, an old beat leather glove with a row of rusty knife blades protruding from the fingers. 
Suddenly, the furnace switches on with a roar. Flames are leaping out of the firebox. Freddy, off camera, laughingly, hot enough for you? Jesse reels around. Freddy is just across the room. Freddy. Uh, there's that RE again. Um, I, I really don't know what that's supposed to mean. So whenever I encounter the RE, I'll just say RE. So Freddy, RE, the glove. Go ahead, Jesse. Try it on for size. Jesse looks at the glove. The blades are no longer rusted, but gleaming and sharp. He throws the weapon to the floor. Freddy moves in closer. Jesse, what do you want? Freddy, I need you to finish my work. Let me teach you, Jesse. We'll have fun. You like my little trick with the bird? Freddy advances. Jesse steps behind a stack of cartons. Freddy, kill for me. Laughing. Come on, Jesse. Come to Freddy. Jesse pushes over a stack of cartons in his path and dives for the steps. Halfway up, he misses his footing and slips, tumbling back down. Another angle as Jesse comes to at the foot of the cellar steps. The furnace has stopped and Freddy is gone. As he gets to his feet, he notices the glove on the floor where he dropped it as shiny and new as the day it was made. Interior, Walsh House, Kitchen, Morning. Mom, Dad, and Angela are all at the breakfast table, picking at their food. None of them is particularly hungry this morning. Jesse enters and heads wordlessly to a coffee pot on the stove. He pours himself a cup and turns abound to face his family. And speaking of coffee, I'm going to take a sip of coffee right now. <clears throat> Jesse and Dad are making an extra effort to avoid each other's eye contact on Angela. She's still feeling bad, drawing little circles in a puddle of maple syrup with a corner of her waffle. Jesse, to Dad, suddenly. Why did it take him five years to sell this house, Dad? Dad shrugs his shoulders uncomfortably. Dad, I don't know. Couldn't get the right price, I suppose. Jesse, and you don't know anything about the murder across the street? And a crazy girl who lived here? Who saw the whole thing? Mom looks at Dad. This is all news to her. Dad, testily. I don't know. A beat, coming clean. They told me something about it, yeah. What difference does it make? He feels Mom stare and finally turns to her. Dad. Oh, come on, Cheryl. How do you think we got such a good deal? To Jesse. Listen, all old houses have stories. Jesse. Did they tell you she went totally out of her mind? That they had to put her away? And that her mother killed herself in our living room? On Angela, she slides up to Mom. Angela. Mommy, I'm scared. Mom, comforting her. Shh. Jesse and Daddy are just making believe, sweetheart. To Jesse. I don't think we should be talking about this now. Dad turns back to Jesse. Dad, indicating Angela. You see what you're doing? Now I don't want to hear another word about it. There's nothing wrong with this house. On Mom. He looks up from Angela and sniffs the air. Mom. Something burning? Mom and Dad both look toward the countertop. The toaster, their POV, glowing red hot, and then, not just smoky toast, but flames leaping out of the bread slots. Mom gasps, and Dad jumps to his feet, grabs a dish towel, and begins beating out the fire. Jesse turns white as he watches the scene. Dad turns white as he watches the scene. 
Dad turns away from the smoldering toaster, tosses the towel aside, and heads back toward the table. Dad, craziest damn thing I ever saw, wasn't even plugged in. Jesse puts his cut, or cup, down hard on the counter and walks out. The screen door slams behind him. Mom looks at Dad, horrified as Angela clings to her side. Exterior, McDonald's parking lot, day. In Jesse's car, as Jesse unrolls the bundle of rags he found the night before and lets the finger knives drop with a clatter on the seat between himself and Lisa. On Lisa's side of the dashboard, we see the remnants of a big fast food breakfast, egg McMuffin, Danish, orange juice, and coffee. Jesse nurses a cup of joe as Lisa picks up the glove and examines it with interest. Lisa, this is amazing. Your dream told you where this was? Jesse nods. Only it was more like, you know, sleepwalking. All I know is I woke up on the cellar floor next to it. He reaches into his knapsack and pulls out the diary. Jesse, forget about going back to sleep after that. I was up all night. More intense. I finished reading this. It gets real crazy towards the end. After all the death stuff. But then she said something really freaky about her mother taking her down to the basement to show her the glove. On Lisa, she's totally sucked into the story wide eyes and waiting for more. She offers a french fry to Jesse. He shakes his head. She pops it into her mouth and nods for Jesse to go on. Jesse. That's when she started talking about Fred Krueger. Lisa. Who? Jesse. Fred Krueger, the guy in her dream who's coming to kill her. It seems he was a real guy. Ten years before, who went around kidnapping kids and killing them? On Lisa, she emits a long, windy whistle. Interior, school corridor, day. Kids are at their lockers, taking off their jackets and getting together everything they'll need for the day. On Jesse and Lisa, as they walk down the hall together. Lisa. Maybe you were having a premonition or something. You know, like those guys who help the police solve crimes and find missing people. You ever had anything like this happen before? Jesse thinks about it. Jesse, finally. No, never. A B. You think that's what it is? Lisa, thoughtfully. I don't know. They stop in the middle of the corridor. Lisa. Can I look at that diary for a little while? Jesse raises his eyebrows vaguely, reaches in his bag, and hands over the book. Lisa, taking it. Thanks. Before she can go on, they are interrupted by a squeaky voice to their side. At the sound of it, Lisa displays annoyed recognition. Carrie, off camera. Hi guys. Longer angle. Lisa. Hi, Carrie. Carrie, to Lisa. I got your invitation yesterday. Thanks. AB. Any cute guys gonna be there? Lisa. Tired sigh. All of them. Carrie. Your dad picking the music again? Lisa. Smiles. Mom's trying to keep him upstairs. Jesse looks at Lisa quizzically. Lisa to Jesse. Last party I had, Dad insisted on playing nothing but Benny Goodman records all night. The class bell rings. Lisa leans over and kisses Jesse. Lisa, I'll see you later, okay? The kiss takes him by surprise as she walks off with Carrie. Jesse calling after her. I may be late. Baseball practice. 
Exterior, high school, practice field, day. The school team has been split up into two sides. There's an air of excitement about, like it's a close game drawing to the end. Grady is on third, waiting to be hit home. The pitcher whines and throws. On the batter, a swing and a miss. Schneider calls him out. He tosses the bat aside, disgustedly. Jesse is on deck. As he approaches the plate, a teammate off camera. Last out. Up to you, Walsh. On Grady. He sneers, like they might as well just concede the game now and go home early. The pitcher sends one right down the middle. Jesse lets it go and Schneider calls a strike. He chokes up a bit on the bat and takes a stance. Another perfect pitch and Jesse lets it go again. Schneider. Strike! Grady slaps himself in the face and shakes his head pitifully. The pitcher throws another. This time, Jesse catches it perfectly, slamming it down the middle for a solid hit. Grady scores a mid-cheers and slaps on the back. Slaps who on the back? Yeah. Jesse holds up at first. Interior, boys' locker room, day. Jesse is at the end of a row of lockers. He pulls off his shirt and tosses it in the locker, takes down a towel and sets it down on the bench next to him. Several boys pass by on their way to their lockers or the showers, giving Jesse the thumbs up. Boys, good game Walsh, way to go Walsh, etc. Grady approaches and goes to his own locker, down a few from Jesse's. Jesse plops down on the bench and slowly pulls off his sneakers. He stops to rub his aching shoulders. Grady, finally. You hit that ball pretty good, Walsh. Jesse. It was okay. Grady. Who told you to choke up that way? Jesse. My dad. He played in the minors for a while when he got out of college. Grady, impressed. No shit. They continue undressing in silence. As Jesse speaks, Coach Schneider steps up behind them. Jesse, Schneider shouldn't have called you out on that double. Grady, yeah, well, Schneider's got a stick up his ass today. Jesse, laughs, Schneider's always got a stick up his ass. Schneider smiles wickedly as he places his hands on the two boys' shoulders. Exterior, athletic field, day. Jesse and Grady trudge along at somewhere between a job and a stumble. They talk to each other with words that are punctuated by huffs, puffs, and side stitches. Jesse, cautiously, you remember your dreams, Grady? Grady, only the wet ones. Jesse shoots him a condescending sneer and decides not to pursue it. Exterior, school parking lot, day. The lot is practically empty with most of the students on their way home by now. Jesse's car is parked in the center. Lisa is leaning on the car, waiting with a stack of books at her side. She looks up as Jesse approaches. Jesse. Sorry, Snyder did it to me again. Lisa, I just got here myself. Went to the public library, proudly. Cut four classes. He opens the door for her. She picks up the books and climbs in. Jesse runs around to the other side and slides in beside her. Jesse, indicating the books. What's all this? Lisa. Research. She kisses him. Hi. An intriguing wink. Come on. Let's go for a ride. Exterior. Highway. Day. The Blue Falcon rolls down the highway. Inside. Jesse is driving as Lisa restacks some of the books on her lap and begins leafing through one. 
Lisa, I'm convinced you've had a genuine psychic vision. Jesse looks over at her inquisitively. Lisa, at first I wasn't sure, because you said that you never had anything like last night happen before. But I found that most people have the potential for tuning in to the other world and never do. It has something to do with the environment like they have to be in a place that's sending signals. Jesse, like a haunted house, right? I don't believe in ghosts. Lisa, you don't have to. You just have to believe in energy. She shifts in her seat to face him. Lisa, intensely. Look, you got electricity in your body, right? Jesse, yeah. I know. Synapsis neuron? Lisa. And heat and chemical reactions? Where does it all go when you die? Jesse. I don't know. Into the air, I suppose. Lisa. Pointing up ahead. Make a left at this corner. Jesse turns at the intersection. Lisa. What about essential energy? The soul? Does that go into the air too? You think there's a good energy and a bad energy? Jesse, confused. I don't know. A beat. Where are we going? Lisa smiles mysteriously. It's a surprise. Exterior, abandoned power plant, day. An old generating plant big enough to have served what was once a small town but run down and obsolete now. The place is charred and the grounds are littered with rubble as if there had been a fire there long ago. The entrance to the plant is boarded up and plastered with no trespassing signs. Many of the boards are missing, providing easy access for the scores of vandals who had torn through there at one time or another. There are no windows at ground level, but the top of the building is lined with many multi-paned frames. All of them are either cracked or missing. Jesse's car pulls into frame, and he and Lisa get out and look the place over. Jesse, what is this place? Lisa, excitedly. Remember the diary? Nancy said that she kept finding herself in a boiler room. Fred Krueger worked here. It's an old power plant, a steam generator. She pulls out several papers and hands them to Jesse. Lisa, here. Jesse, what's this? On the papers, Xeroxes of newspaper articles. The headline reads, Springwood Slasher Arrested. Lisa, off camera. I did some reading up on our friend, Fred Krueger. Jesse leafs through the papers. Each one's a front page from a local newspaper. Headline, Krueger freed on technicality, DA resigns. Headline, justice done, Krueger killed by mob. Springwood slasher dies in hellish inferno. Jesse sucks in his breath. Interior, entranceway. Abandoned power plant, day. Jesse and Lisa climb between a pair of boards and step inside. On Lisa, she walks toward the center of the plant, fascinated. Interior, power plant. We can see the remnants of a large boiler room. Big steel pipes jut out of the floor in a tangle of elbows and valves and a clutter of debris. A one-story holding tank rises above a concrete pit and is met on top by a maze of catwalks just under the windows. Although most of the ceiling has burned away, the interior is surprisingly intact for a derelict building and the overhead light distracts form or from any intrinsic creepiness the place would possess after dark. <clears throat> Jesse steps in behind her. Lisa, solemnly. 
He kidnapped 20 kids and brought them all here to die. She gives herself a chill, but shakes it off and turns to Jesse. Lisa, so you feeling anything? Jesse, what do you mean? Lisa, I thought you might be able to make a connection. Jesse shrugs his shoulders and puts his hands to the side of his mouth. Jesse, calling. Any ghosts in here? Lisa, come on, cut it out. Jesse, well, what am I supposed to do? Lisa, I don't know, concentrate or something. Jesse shifts his legs and stares up at the ceiling. He closes his eyes. Jesse, still concentrating. I feel like a jerk. Lisa, shh, just concentrate. Jesse walks around in a small circle, keeping his head up and his eyes closed. Lisa, anything? Jesse shakes his head. Uh-uh. A beat. Wait. He walks slowly across the room, almost in a trance, until he comes to a board leaning up against the foot of a mesh iron stairway that leads up to the catwalks. On the board, as his hand reaches over to touch it, on Lisa, stepping over next to Jesse, another angle, he pulls the board away, a large rat in her nest, with her young, snarls at him. Jesse and Lisa jump into each other's arms. Exterior, abandoned power plant, late afternoon. Jesse and Lisa walk along the outskirts of the building to a pretty cluster of shade trees nearby. Lisa hoists herself up on a boulder and looks at the building. Jesse, Disappointed? Lisa. About what? Jesse. About not finding any boogeymen? Lisa smiles. I'll get over it. She is disappointed. She wanted to find some boogeymen. Jesse comes up close to her and they stare at each other. Lisa, finally. You are sensitive. I mean, you sense that the rat was there, and I can feel something about you. Sometimes I feel like I know what you're thinking. Jesse moves in closer and puts his arms on her shoulders. Jesse, suggestively. Yeah? Lisa, ignoring the suggestion. Maybe it only happens when you're sleeping. That's the way it was with Nancy, wasn't it? Jesse. Now there's an idea we can take off on. Maybe we should drive out to the beach tonight and lay out a couple of blankets and... Winks. Until I fall asleep. Lisa, slightly. Maybe we can do that. Strictly scientific, of course. Jesse moves in until their lips are almost touching. Jesse. Nancy went bonkers from this thing. You wouldn't be afraid of being out on the beach with a potential lunatic? Lisa, Ghostbusters are fearless. They kiss, not little friendly pecks like before. This is the real thing. Jesse drops his arms to her waist, and she opens her legs so that he can get in real close. Suddenly, Jesse groans in pain and stands upright, tearing from their embrace. For the briefest instant, we can see protrusions grow and subside on his forehead and the side of his face. Lisa, what is it? What's wrong? Jesse, holding his stomach. Whoa. Lisa, what is it? Jesse, I don't know. A sharp pain. Lisa watches his... him... Helplessly, finally, the agony lifts from Jesse's face. He straightens up. Jesse, it's gone now. Lisa, oh, Jesse. 
Lisa puts her arms around him. Lisa. Jesse, this is no good. You've got to get some sleep, Jesse. You've got to get some sleep. Interior. Walsh House. Jesse's room. Night. Jesse is in bed, tossing restlessly and panting heavily. He is drenched with sweat and continues to perspire profusely as he sits up and turns on his bedside lamp. A thunderhead is rumbling somewhere nearby. The plastic shade of the lamp is melting. <coughs> he scans the room, picking out various indications of the intense heat that is surrounding him. A candle on his bookshelf collapses into a puddle of wax. The laminated top of the night table is bubbling. An unsheathed record album hangs over the corner of the desk. His portable stereo has caved in the center, a Dolly-esque tableau. Sound over, scraping. Jesse gets out of bed, crossing to the desk. The scraping sound intensifies. Close on the drawer, as Jesse opens it. Inside, the glove, fingers moving, independently, unattached, scraping little cuts in the bottom of the drawer. On Jesse, slamming the drawer shut. Sound over, a swishing sound, followed by a thump again and again. Upstairs hallway, Jesse, barefoot and wearing only a pair of jeans and an unbuttoned shirt, steps up to the door to Angela's room. The sound is coming from inside. He opens the door. Angela is standing in the middle of the floor, in her nightgown, seemingly oblivious to the heat. She is jumping rope and chanting, Angela, one, two, Freddy's coming for you. On Jesse, petrified, Angela off camera, three, four, better lock your door. On Angela, she sees her brother staring at her. She doesn't stop jumping, but smiles and continues her jingle. Angela, five, six, grab your crucifix. Jesse slams the door shut. Kitchen, Jesse enters, looks out the windows. A huge bolt of lightning rips through the night sky. A multiple flash, if, blue light strobes through the kitchen, followed by a crack of intense thunder. Another flash of lightning cuts across the kitchen itself, shattering some dishes on the countertop, leaving a plume of black smoke. Exterior, downtown street, night. The rain continues to come down in buckets. Jesse enters, shot, and walks, unprotected in his drenched jeans and shirt, and seemingly without any knowledge of where he is going. The streets are totally empty. Exterior, Dawn's Place, Night. A seedy tavern on a badly lit corner. Jesse steps into frame. He stares at the place before stepping up to he door. Interior, Dawn's Place, Night. The toughest looking bar in the entire city. The place is packed with prostitutes, pimps, traveling salesmen, a couple of transvestites, and a generous delegation of the leather and chain contingency. <laughs> prostitutes, pimps, and traveling salesmen, oh my! <laughs> Hey, I gotta get some joy out of this script. So far, this script hasn't been as funny as Nightmare 3, but I'm trying. I'm trying to get some funny stuff in there for you guys. <clears throat> uh, Jesse enters and crosses to the bar amid a few stairs. Amid? He sits on a stool. The bartender draws a cold beer and presents it to Jesse. As the bartender turns away, Jesse reaches for the glass. 
A hand slaps down on his wrist and holds it tightly. He looks up. Coach Schneider dum, 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 is standing over him. He is wearing a muscle shirt, a gold chain around his neck, and he has a sick grin on his face. Interior, gymnasium, night. Jesse is barefoot, jogging around the outer edge of the gym floor and looking as if he's about to collapse from exhaustion. On Schneider, leaning against a wall of the gym, watching Jesse run. As Jesse comes around for another lap, Schneider reaches out and grabs him, throwing him into a wall of folding wooden bleachers. Jesse is dazed, ready to drop. Schneider, barking, hit the showers. Interior, boys' locker room, shower room, night. Jesse turns on one of the faucets and lets the hot water hit him full on. Interior, coach's office, night. Schneider turns to a huge padlocked cabinet on the wall. He unlocks it and opens the doors. It is filled with a variety of athletic equipment, dumbbells, jump ropes, and volleyballs, etc. Schneider selects a pair of jump ropes from the cabinet and sets them down on his desk. A distinct <laughs> makes him look up, and he goes to the door and looks out into the hall. Shower room. Jesse continues showering. Interior, coach's office. Snyder turns back to his office. There is another ping. <clears throat> A tennis racket hanging on the wall has two broken strings. Two more strings smoke, then snap with a ping. A basketball leaps off a shelf of the equipment cabinet and bounce on the floor at Schneider's feet. <clears throat> Schneider bends down to pick it up and two more balls jump out onto the floor. A fourth ball flies out and knocks over a trophy on his desk. Schneider hits the deck when a dumbbell streaks across the office and slams into the window, cracking the thick wired glass. On Schneider, he makes his way to the cabinet by crawling along the floor as basketballs, volleyballs, even a medicine ball fly over his head. He reaches up to close the cabinet doors. Another angle. A jump rope on the desk unravels like a harpoon mine and wraps an end of itself around Schneider's wrist. The other end pulls hard and yanks Schneider off balance. He reaches up to close the cabinet doors. Another angle. A jump rope on the desk unravels like a harpoon line and wraps an end of itself around Schneider's wrist. The other end pulls hard and yanks Schneider off balance. As he reaches with his free arm to unwrap his wrist, the second rope rockets off the desktop and secures itself to his other wrist. The office door opens by itself. The ropes drag Snyder screaming from the room. Shower room. Jesse turns as the shower head next to the one he is using, gurgles and suddenly comes on full. And suddenly all the showers are on, spewing water and steam. We hear Schneider screams as he is dragged into the room through great puddles of water and against the tiled wall opposite Jesse. The showers on this side are off. The boy watches in horror as the ropes shoot up to two adjacent shower nozzles and hoist a coach into a helpless spread eagle facing the wall. His clothes shear from his body like sheets of tissue paper. A stack of towels comes to life, snapping in mid-air at Schneider's butt and back. As they hit him, they draw blood. On Jesse, as the room fills with gray clouds of steam until he is nearly obscured. Just a dark human form in the corner of the shower room. Another angle on Schneider, as a figure in a green and red sweater and a battered fedora cuts through the clouds 
cackling and throwing his weapon arm back like a World Series pitcher about to lob a fastball. Schneider screams painfully as the knives cut four long tears in him, starting at the top of his naked back, cutting through his flesh. The weapon arm strikes again. Schneider screams, goes limp. Wide angle, Schneider. Blood begins to flow out of all the shower heads on Schneider's side. Schneider hangs limply from the shower heads. On the murderer, camera dollies in fast to reveal it is Jesse. He screams. Jesse lifts his hand into frame. He is wearing Freddy's bloodied glove. Jesse. No! Oh God! No! He slowly drops to his knees, sloshing in a crimson puddle, and stares up to the heavens. Jesse, screaming, No! <laughs> Smash cut to interior, Walsh house, foyer, night. We hear the doorbell ringing repeatedly until the lights flick on and Dad hurries to the door, wrapping a robe over his pajamas. His POV as he opens the door. Two policemen in rain slickers stand on either side of Jesse. He is naked but is wrapped in a blanket. His hair is soaked and dripping over his face. First policeman. This belong to you? Dad can't believe what he is looking at. He just nods his head. The second policeman gives Jesse a slight push across the threshold. He stumbles into the house. First policeman. We found him wandering out on the highway, naked. Keep a leash on him, will ya? Cut to kitchen, a tea kettle whistling. Mom takes the kettle from the stove and pours it into a mug. She steeps the tea bag as she crosses to the table, and Jesse, wide awake, holding the blanket tightly around his neck, takes the cup from his mother. Dad paces the floor angrily. Dad. Okay, we're gonna put our cards on the table, here and now. There's not going to be any retribution, no fire in brimstone. I only have two questions, and you'll answer them and we'll all go to bed, okay? Jesse nods weakly. Dad. Okay. What are you taking, and who are you getting it from? Jesse snorts and shakes his head ironically. Jesse. I'm not taking drugs, Dad. To Mom. Can I go to bed now? Mom touches his cheek tenderly. Sure, go ahead. Dad tries to burn a hole through him with his eyes as Jesse gets up from the table and leaves the room. As the double hinged doors slap closed behind him, Dad turns to Mom without a change of expression. Dad, no question about it. He's on something. Exterior, Walsh House, morning. Dad is standing on a ladder, unbolting a set of security bars from the windows. He watches from above as Jesse runs out the door, followed by Mom. Mom. Jesse, please, let's talk about this. Jesse, pleading. I'm okay. Just leave me alone. Jesse walks over to his car and climbs in. Mom turns to Dad, who is watching the scene curiously. Mom, he needs professional help. I think we should take him to a psychiatrist. Dad, incensed. Are you nuts or something? What the hell is that going to do? Mom, I don't know. I just know he needs help, and we don't know how to give it to him. Dad shifts on the ladder and begins to protest. Mom, squelching it. Don't fight me on this. She stomps back toward the house. Dad, calling after her. He needs a kick in the butt. That's what he needs. He needs a methadone clinic. She throws back a dirty look. Mom, 
Oh, blow it out your ass, Ken. <laughs> <sighs> With that, Dad loses his footing on the ladder and drops down several runs. Exterior, road, day. Jesse's car travels slowly and turns onto a tree-lined street. Inside, Jesse drives silently with Lisa, looking over at him, upset. Lisa, upset. Will you stop and tell me what's wrong? Jesse, staring straight ahead. I'm fine. Nothing's wrong. Lisa, undeterred. You didn't say more than two words to me the whole way here. You had another nightmare, didn't you? Jesse. Yeah, I had a bad night. Lisa. You want to talk about it? Jesse. My dad thinks I'm on drugs. My mom thinks I'm crazy, and I'm not sure I don't agree with her. Exterior. High school. Day. As Jesse's car pulls into the lot. Another angle. As they turn a corner. Jesse jams on the brakes. Their POV, the gymnasium wing, in the distance. A crowd of students is gathered in a ring about three deep outside the doors leading to the practice fields. In the car, Jesse. Oh, God. He throws open the door, jumps out, and runs toward the crowd. Bewildered, Lisa does likewise, running after him. As they get closer, they can see that the entire area is cordoned of with red plastic ribbons. Uh, several policemen and officials are coming in and out of the building. A teacher is trying to disperse the students, clapping his hands together and pushing through the rubberneckers. Teacher, okay gang, let's move along. Jesse stops at the edge of the barricade cranes his neck to see what's going on. Grady spots Jesse and runs over to his side. Jesse is turning white as he watches the scene and listens to Grady's recap. Grady. Holy shit, man. Where have you been? Fucking Schneider got wasted last night. Jesse swallows hard to regain his composure. Lisa arrives at his side. Jesse. Oh, Jesus. I'm going to be sick. Grady ignores him. He must have been working late and some fruitcake came in and sliced him up like a kielbasa. In the shower, left bloody footprints all over the... Jesse clamps his hand over his mouth and breaks for some bushes against the building. Grady looks at the horrified Lisa and gives a puzzled shrug. Interior. School cafeteria. Day. On the food line, Lisa and Carrie are on the lunch line, sliding their trays along the rails. And Carrie is wearing a Walkman with the volume turned way up. We can almost make out the song. Carrie, that was something this morning, huh? About Schneider, I mean. Lisa nods and takes a plate of macaroni and cheese from one of the kitchen staff. She doesn't want to talk about it. Carrie, Jesse sure took it bad, didn't he? Lisa shrugs and moves her tray away from Carrie's, toward the cashier. Carrie picks up a piece of cake from a shelf and slides her tray down until she's next to Lisa again. In the dining room, Jesse is sitting at a table, a tray of food in front of him, untouched. He glances up at Grady as he sits down next to him and starts digging in. Grady with his mouth full. Look, I'm sorry about Schneider, ma'am. I didn't know you were so close. <laughs> Jesse doesn't qualify that with a response. Grady, you want to go out to a movie or something tonight? Get your mind off things? Jesse shakes his head. Lisa comes over to the table with her tray and sits down next to Jesse. Carrie follows and sits next to Grady. Carrie. Hi, guys. To Grady, coquettishly. Hi, Ronnie. You going to Lisa's party tomorrow night? Grady, without looking up from his food. 
Carol, I'm grounded. Carrie, how come? Grady, we're throwing my grandmother down a flight of stairs. Carrie, taking him seriously, nods gravely. Lisa looks at Jesse's tray of untouched food. Lisa, to Jesse, you should eat something. You'll feel better. Jesse, I'm not hungry. Lisa, I wish you'd talk to me. We can figure it out, you know. We can figure it out together. Jesse, there's nothing to figure out. Grady, to Lisa, disgustedly, you're wasting your time. The guy's a basket case. Jesse, shut up, Grady. Grady pushes his tray aside. Grady, you want me to shut up? Fine, I'll shut up. That's fine. See you around, buddy. Grady gets up and storms away from the table. Lisa, deeply pained, looks at Jesse. Jesse avoids her stare until he just drops his head into his hands and tries not to cry in front of his friends. He composes himself quickly and digs his fork into his lunch, choking down some macaroni. Interior, Lisa's house, kitchen, night. Lisa, her mother and father, are sitting, eating dinner. Lisa's mind is not at the table with her. Mrs. Paletti, to Lisa, Bought some nice strawberries at the farm today. We can have some shortcake for your friends tomorrow. Lisa looks up and the smiles blandly. <laughs> Mrs. Paletti, I also wangled a promise out of your father. On Mr. Paletti, he scowls slightly. Lisa, politely. What's that? Mrs. Paletti, we're going to stay out of your way tomorrow night. Lisa, you're going out? Mrs. Paletti, we're going to bed. She looks at her husband, Mrs. Paletti, early. Exterior, Walsh House, night. Quiet, the lights inside are all out. Interior, Walsh House, basement, night. We hear footsteps and we travel with the sound along the floor to the foot of the basement steps. Intruders POV. As he climbs the steps and approaches the door to the main part of the house. The camera is moving faster now, leaping the top steps and crashing through the doorway and onto the foyer floor. It crosses the foyer and begins climbing the stairs to the bedroom level. It stops at Angela's room and opens the door. Angela sleeps soundly, peacefully. It crosses over to the bed. A menacing shadow creeps over her form. The taloned glove pulls down on the blankets and she shifts position in the center of the bed, innocent and vulnerable. We see the shadow of the intruder on the wall. It moves in close to the sleeping child and emits a guttural, inhuman voice. Intruder, off camera. Wake up, little girl. Her eyes flutter open. She looks up at the intruder and smiles. Angela, sleepily. What time is it? Another angle. We now see that it's Jesse standing over her. He's in his underpants drenched with sweat and hunched over, as if all the muscles in his body were twisted around each other. The sound of Angela's voice softens him. He slowly straightens up and looks about the room, as if wondering how he got there. Jesse, himself again. It's late. Go back to sleep. She nods and closes her eyes. Jesse starts to pull the covers back over her and stops suddenly. His POV, his right hand is wearing the glove. The glove. Interior, Walsh House, Jesse's room, night. The desk lamp and a late movie on the TV are the only sources of light in the room. 
we see that the bed is rumpled and empty, and we pan across the room to Jesse, sitting on the floor in front of the door, knees up against his chest, trying with all his strength to stay awake. He has a mug of black coffee in his hand and a pot of java at his side. He tops off his cup and reaches into the breast pocket of his shirt, withdrawing a small vial of pills. A bottle of no dose. He rips the cap off with his teeth <laughs> and dumps half the bottle into his coffee. Ish. I'm surprised that wouldn't kill him. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it, maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. <laughs> <clears throat> Exterior, Walsh House, morning. A dark, dreary day. There are no morning sounds except for the squeaking of an old rattle trap bicycle as an overweight paper boy swings by and lobs the morning edition over the lawn. The paper skids off the front steps and into the garden. Interior, Walsh House, foyer, morning. Jesse walks down the steps. He looks ragged and exhausted and worse than ever. Outside the kitchen, he stops before going through the double hinged door to push his hair back and forces a well-rested, easy-going guise. In the kitchen, Dad and Angela are sitting at the table. Mom is pouring some coffee into a couple of cups. Jesse enters. Jesse. Morning. Mom. How'd you sleep, honey? Okay? Jesse. Fine. Mom gives him a quick glance. Mom. You're looking a little better today. Dad looks at Jesse's pale skin, the light stubble on his chin, and his dark, bloodshot eyes and turns to Mom as if she's nuts. Exterior. Lisa's house. Poolside. Night. The entire pool area has been done up to the max. Japanese lanterns have been strung up above the fence, a long table covered with festively arranged salads and condiments, stretches across the patio in front of the sliders, and a Benny Goodman dance tune is blaring through some outdoor speakers. An all too bright underwater light makes the blue water shimmer crystal clear. A score of nubile girls in scanty swimsuits and athletic guys in cutoffs and trunks scamper around, eating, swimming, and horsing around. On Mr. Paletti, standing over the gas grill, wearing a kiss to cook chef's hat and apron, cooking up a mess of hamburgers and hot dogs. On Mrs. Paletti and Lisa, stepping out of the house through the sliders, carrying more plates of food outside. A boy bounces once on the diving board and cannonballs into the center of the pool, splashing everything within a 15-foot radius, including Mr. Paletti, who spins around from the grill, annoyed. Mr. Paletti, hey, watch it there. Lisa turns to her mother, mortified. Mrs. Paletti hands her the platter she is holding and gives Lisa a reassuring squeeze on the shoulder before leaving her side and crossing toward her husband. Lisa turns her attention to Jesse at the far corner of the patio, sitting in a lounger, alone. He looks worried and detached. She looks back toward the grill. Mrs. Paletti is pulling her husband away, against his will. He finally relents and beckons a boy over. He turns his spatula over to him, surrenders his chef's hat, and allows Lisa's mom to escort him back toward the house. Jesse, Lisa's POV. He finally gets up and crosses toward the cabanas, going inside and shutting the door. Back to Lisa, as her mother and father approach. Mrs. Paletti, we're going up to bed now. Lisa, gratefully. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Mr. Paletti clearly doesn't like this arrangement. He looks behind him at all the horny young boys and turns back to Lisa, Mr. Paletti, sternly. 12.30, miss. No later. 
Lisa nods agreeably. 12.30, I promise. Mrs. Paletti takes her husband by the arm again and leads him up to the sliders. He turns around before going through. Mr. Paletti, and don't forget to lock the gate. Lisa nods. Good night, Daddy. Mr. Paletti is half led, half pushed through the doorway. Mrs. Paletti pulls the slider closed behind them. Interior, cabana, night. A roomy dressing area with an open shower stall at the back. There's a wide wooden bench along one wall covered with clothing and towels. Jesse stands in the center of the room, putting his pants on. He is shirtless and shoeless. Sound over. A knock on the door. Lisa, off screen. Jesse? Jesse hesitates, uncomfortable. Jesse, be out in a minute. Exterior, cabana. Lisa waits for Jesse. Finally, he unlatches the door. His shirt is on, unbuttoned. Lisa steps into the cabana. Interior, cabana. Lisa shuts the door behind her. The two look at each other a moment. Then, Jesse looks away and continues buttoning his shirt. Jesse, I think I'd better go. I'm just not into it tonight. I'm sorry. Lisa, why won't you talk to me? Jesse, will you leave me alone? Please. Jesse crosses to the bench and sits to put on his shoes. Lisa, you're not being fair to me. I'm worried about you, and I want to help you get through this thing. Jesse, what are you going to do? How are you going to help? I'm losing my mind, breaking down. I don't want to have you watch me fall apart. Lisa goes to Jesse. She puts a comforting arm on his shoulder. Lisa, it's okay, Jesse. Jesse takes her hand and holds it tight. She sits beside him. Jesse, choked. I'm afraid to go to sleep. I'm afraid to stay awake. I'm ruining your party. They're going to put me away for sure. Lisa, we'll figure it out together. We'll stay up all night if we have to. I won't let anything happen to you. They look into each other's eyes. Lisa kisses him ever so gently. Then again, he kisses her. Their kisses grow hungrier. Love conquers fear, and they embrace fully, kissing passionately. Poolside, three boys are huddled together, looking up at the Paletti's bedroom window. Boy one, any second now. The bedroom window, their POV, the lights flick out. Boy one, off camera, quietly, party time. On the wet bar, someone reaches over to the stereo, pops out the Benny Goodman cassette, and flicks the radio on. Van Halen blasts out of the speakers. On Carrie, in the pool, up to her neck with a hunk. They both look up as the music changes. The top of her bathing suit floats up to the surface. Carrie. Oh, wow. Van Halen. Interior, Lisa's house, the Paletti's bedroom, night. At the sound of the music, Mr. Paletti sits up in bed, angrily. Mrs. Paletti puts an arm on his shoulder. Mrs. Paletti, quietly, let them have their fun, honey. Mrs. Paletti pulls out a pair of earplugs and hands them to Mr. Paletti, who grumbles, sticks them in his ear, and drops back down into his pillow. Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside, night. Somebody switches off the lights to general applause. Back to Carrie and the hunk. They are in a steamy embrace when the underwater lights go out. The rest of her suit pops up out of the water. On some bushes, as a couple pulls out a red wagon, stashed in the shrubbery and loaded with beer. Interior, cabana, night. Jesse and Lisa 
rolling around on the floor, a lot of heavy petting, not doing it, but serious, heated stuff just the same. His hand wrapped around Lisa's wrist, pinning it gently to the floor. On Lisa, her eyes closed, feeling him, definitely feeling him. Close to shot, Jesse. Jesse is about to take down Lisa's swimsuit top when an ungodly, long, iridescent, serpent-like tongue flicks a foot out of his mouth, wiggles, and flicks back in. Jesse moans lasciviously, not his own voice. Another angle, Jesse pushes himself away from Lisa and scrambles to his feet. Lisa, unaware of what happened, is puzzled and upset. On Lisa, sitting up on the floor. Lisa, what's wrong? Jesse tucks in his shirt and buttons his pants. He is visibly shaken. Jesse, I'll see you. Lisa just looks at him, helplessly. He slips out the cabana door and shuts it. On Lisa, she gets up slowly. She's profoundly worried. Interior, Grady's bedroom, night. Grady is sleeping on his back, dead to the world. Suddenly, a hand clamps down over his mouth. A light flicks on. Longer angle, Grady's bedroom. It's Jesse. A window is open in the background. The curtains in disarray. He lifts his hand from Grady's mouth, and Grady scrambles out of bed. Grady, hoarsely. Jesus Christ, you scared the shit out of me. Jesse, I'm sorry. Grady, what are you doing here? Jesse, you gotta let me stay here tonight, Grady. Grady, are you nuts or something? Jesse, listen to me, Grady. This is serious. Something really weird is happening. It started out like just bad dreams, but it's getting real bad. Grady is tired and cranky, and he doesn't want to hear this. Grady, oh, would you get out of here? Go and take a sleeping pill or something. He flops back down on his bed and puts his arm over his eyes. Grady, in fact, take a whole bottle and do the world a favor. Jesse sits on the edge of the bed. Jesse, I killed Schneider, Grady. Grady lifts his arm from his eyes and stares at Jesse preposterously. Jesse nods. Only it wasn't me. I was there, but it was like something inside of me, moving me around. Then last night it made me go into my sister's room, and tonight with Lisa and the cabana. We were on the floor. I felt it happening again. He grabs Grady's arm. Jesse, he wanted me to kill them, Grady. Grady continues his dumbfounded stare. Grady, finally, you're fucked in the head. Jesse, I'm scared, Grady. I know it sounds crazy, but there's something trying to get into my body. Grady sneers. The only thing trying to get into your body is female, and waiting for you on the cabana floor, and you want to sleep with me. <laughs> Go figure. Jesse. Look, I don't care if you believe me or not. Grady. I believe you. You had some scary dreams, okay? Jesse, frustrated. No! Shakes his head. I don't know. Everything's all mixed up. Suddenly angry. What difference does it make? I'm in trouble here. I need your help. Grady lets that sink in. Grady, softer. Okay, schmuck. What do you want me to do? Jesse, just watch me. If anything weird happens, like if I start dreaming weird, or try to walk out of here, you gotta try to bring me out of it. Okay, it says, hiss me over the head if you have to, but I think it's supposed to be hit me over the head if you have to. Just don't let me leave. <laughs> Grady looks down at the floor, sighs, and nods his head. Jesse. And Grady? Grady looks up. Jesse. 
don't fall asleep. Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside, night. The underwater lights are still off. The music has calmed down a bit, and most of the kids are more into necking than swimming. Two bodies are rolled up in a blanket together. From a short squeal, we can deduce that it's Carrie and her hunk. <laughs> uh, the barbecue boy has remained steadfast at his post, although his girlfriend has joined him, and he's paying more attention to her than the hot dogs on the grill. On Lisa. She's sitting on one of the lounges. Her eyes are red from crying. She's being comforted by a girlfriend, Patty. Patty, why don't you just call him? Lisa, tearfully, he won't talk to me. Patty, well, you're not doing him or yourself any good sitting here and worrying. Lisa looks at her friend. Lisa, I should go see him, but I don't know, the party and all. Patty, encouragingly, go ahead, I'll hold down the fort. Lisa, getting up. Thanks, Patty. You're a pal. Interior, Grady's bedroom, night. Grady is sitting up in bed, staring at the TV. He turns to Jesse, slumped in a nearby chair, asleep. Grady switches off the TV with the remote. Grady, sweet dreams, buddy. Grady turns off the reading light by the bed. He gives a final look at Jesse before he pushes the whole thing out of his mind with a disgusted wave of his arm and lays back down on Jesse. Suddenly, his eyes open widely. Jesse. Grady? Grady mumbles in obscenity and turns over on his side to face Jesse. Grady. What? Jesse. It's happening again. Grady turns the reading light back on in time to see Jesse double over and curl up in obviously incredible pain, falling to his knees. He flails out as if 1,000 volts were going through his body and begins to choke on his tongue. Grady scrambles out of bed and dances around Jesse, not knowing what to do on Jesse's hand, as he raises it and his fingers spread widely apart. Four steel razor knives tear out from within, W-I-T-H-I-N-G, the tips of Jesse's fingers like long, bloody switchblades. Grady stands by helplessly as Jesse writhes, and then it is like some crazed beast in Jesse's gut tearing its way out of the skin, like someone stepping through a thick latex film. As the skin peels away, thousands of capillaries pull apart, spraying blood everywhere in a fine, almost powdery mist. The transformation is almost complete when Fred Krueger's body steps out of the red cloud. All that is left of Jesse is his screaming face, plastered like a grisly rubber mask over Freddy's own disfigured features. Grady backs away toward the door. Grady, screaming, No! 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 On Freddy, he stands up with an evil smile, all there now, and puts on his battered hat. Angle, Grady's bedroom. Grady tries desperately to get out, but the door won't open. Freddy cackles evilly as he cuts off Grady's screams by grabbing his throat with his unarmed hand. He pushes Grady up against the door and lifts him off the floor like he was hanging a picture. We hear muffled calls from outside the door, the off-camera cries of concerned parents. The doorknob rattles as they try to get in the room to check on their son. Boom, 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 a fist hammering against the door behind Grady's head, his father trying to get in. Mr. Grady. <laughs> Off camera. What's going on? Open the door, Ronnie. 
Freddy draws back his knife hand and prepares to plunge it into Grady's stomach like he was spearing a pot roast. Outside the door, Mr. and Mrs. Grady in their night clothes. Mrs. Grady stands with her hands over her mouth as Mr. Grady grabs the no again and bangs his fist repeatedly against the door on Freddy, throwing force into his cutting arm. We cut before impact to outside the door. We hear Grady scream as the steel blades cut through his body and poke out through the door like it was made of balsa. They wiggle slightly to pull free and are retracted with an ungodly squeak. Mrs. Grady screams. Mr. Grady, oh God! Mr. Grady throws his shoulder with all his might against the door. A second excruciating scream inside, and the knives cut through the door, inches from Mr. Grady's head. When they pull out, blood is soaking through the knife holes. It looks as if the door itself is bleeding. On Grady, breathing his last few gasps. On Grady's parents, they watch in stunned horror. On Grady, he sinks slowly to the floor, dead. Freddy watches as his victim slides into a heap on the floor. Only we see now that it isn't Freddy anymore, but Jesse again, panting exhaustedly and dripping Grady's blood from just under his elbow to the sharp points of the razor-tipped glove he wears on his hand. The door is budging open against Grady's body, a little more with each crash of Mr. Grady's shoulder against the other side. Jesse is coming to, himself again, and he views what he has done to his best friend with terror-crazed eyes. His eye catches his own reflection in a full-length mirror on the wall. The image reflected is of Freddy. Jesse. No. Backing away from the body. No, no, no. Screaming toward the mirror. You son of a bitch! You killed him! Jesse hurls the glove at the mirror, cracking it. Freddy's mocking image, however, remains. The last sound we hear is a demonic mix of Jesse's own screams and Freddy's cackling laugh. Interior, Lisa's house, foyer, night. Lisa has changed into a white shirt and a pair of cutoffs. She hurries downstairs, buttoning up her shirt and crosses the foyer floor to the door. She opens the door and Jesse collapses in her arms. He is bloody, bruised, and his clothes are torn and dirty. Lisa frenzied. Jesse! God, what happened? Jesse, hyperventilating. I killed him. I killed him. She draws him in close, trying to comfort him. She looks at his bloody arms. Lisa. Oh, Christ, you're hurt. Jesse, weeping now. I killed Grady. I killed Grady, Lisa. I killed Schneider. Oh, my God, he's inside me. Lisa looks around frantically as she holds Jesse tightly against her body. Lisa. Who, Jesse? Jesse. He's just waiting to take me when I sleep. Lisa. Who? Who's doing this to you? He looks at her as if she should know. Jesse. Fred Krueger. Psychotically. He's been trying to get a hold of me, to use me. He needs me to get out of his world into ours. He's going to take me again. Lisa. No, Jesse. This isn't happening. It's got to be everything you've taken in. Schneider and the diary and the glove. Only it's all mixed up. He pushes away from her, frustrated. Jesse. No! Christ! How can I make you understand? He tried to make me kill Angela last night. 
Look at the blood on my hands. <coughs> hmm. He begins to sob. Jesse. Oh God, I did that to Grady. Suddenly coherent, realizing he owns me. Lisa puts her arms around him. She strokes his head, trying to calm him. Lisa, I'm not going to let anyone take you from me. There's got to be a reason. We'll figure it out together. Suddenly, something makes Lisa stop. Lisa, wait a minute. She leads Jesse toward the study entryway and opens the door. Lisa, wait in here for me. I'll be right back. Jesse goes into the study. Lisa hurries off. Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside night. The barbecue boy has left his post entirely. He is sitting on the nearby bench with his girlfriend on his lap, and his chef's hat askew on the back of his head. Suddenly, the girl points toward the grill. Girlfriend. Hey, look. The kid looks over. His POV, the grill. A platter of hot dogs on an attached cutting board. The hot dogs are exploding, bursting into flames, one by one, until the whole plate is engulfed. Barbecue. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this script is saying that the barbecue is saying, holy shit. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine that? It's like a barbecue in the movie screaming, holy shit. <laughs> ah, I love it. <laughs> but actually, the barbecue boy says, holy shit, presumably. And he jumps up picks up the flaming platter with his hands and tosses it like a hot potato onto the cooking grid, slamming the lid down with a crash. Some of the witnesses hoot and laugh, and there's a scattering of applause before Barbecue Boy can take a bow for his bravery. His attention is drawn to the sound of rapid popping, his POV, the wagon of beer on the ground near some bushes. The pool taps are popping off, and geysers of brew are shooting up toward the sky. You know, for for all I know, it probably was the barbecue that said, holy shit. <laughs> because, I mean, in the movie, there's, like, so much, like, just weird shit that happens in this scene. Like, you know, the, the beer, you know, explodes, and the barbecue explodes, and everything, and the lights above the pool explodes first. So for all I know, maybe in the script, the barbecue did say, holy shit. <laughs> His POV, the wagon of beer on the ground near some bushes. The pool tabs are popping off, and geysers of brew are shooting up toward the sky. I already read that part. Sorry! Interior, Lisa's house, study, night. Lisa opens up the diary. Jessie looks over her shoulder. Lisa. Something Nancy said, her last entry. Reading. He is evil itself. I know now that I brought him into my world. We all did. Gave him all the energy he needed. Our screams were all he needed. Now I will take it back. Deny him. She looks up at Jesse. Lisa. She wasn't crazy. He holds up the book. <sighs> she holds up the book. All this really happened. A beat. You can fight him. Jesse looks confused. Lisa, remember what I said about good energy and bad energy? He thrives on the bad energy. Hate, anger, fear, he is bad energy. A beat. You've been afraid of him. Jesse suddenly winces in pain and puts his hand to his stomach. Jesse, panicking. Oh God, he's coming back. To Lisa, get out of here, Lisa. Cut to, the window slams shut and locks. Lisa, frightened, 
looks behind her and back to Jesse, frantically. Lisa, fight it, Jesse. Front door, foyer, the deadbolt turns with a loud snap. Interior, Lisa's house, Socleti's bedroom, night. Their bedroom door latches firmly. Mr. Paletti sits up with a start. Mr. Paletti, what was that? Exterior, gate, Lisa's house, poolside, night. A large padlock swings around and snaps shut. Interior, Lisa's house, study, night. Jesse is doubled over in pain. Lisa has her hands on his shoulders, shaking him, trying to bring him out of it. The heat has become intense in the room. They are both sweating profusely, and their clothes cling to their wet bodies. Lisa, you created him. You can destroy him. He lives off your fear. Fight him, Jesse. Jesse, painfully, I can't. Tiny bubbles are rising through the top of the aquarium tank, and the angelfish float on the surface of water, poached. Interior, Lisa's house, the Paletti's bedroom, night. Mr. Paletti is standing inside the door in an open robe, tugging on the knob as Mrs. Paletti joins him at his side. He, too, is drenched with sweat, and the heat has steamed up all the interior windows. Mrs. Paletti, what is it? Mr. Paletti, the lock's jammed. Suddenly, there is a blast of music as a bedside clock radio comes to life and immediately begins melting in the center. The music groans to a stop after less than a bar and the amber dial lamp dies. Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside, night. Carrie and Hunk in the pool again. Steam is rising off the surface, and the water seems a bit rough for a swimming pool, you think? Uh, Carrie calls out to no one in particular. Carrie, hey, can somebody turn down the heater? Interior, Lisa's house, study, night. Jesse is writhing on the floor as Lisa jumps around him, helplessly. Lisa, you're not afraid of him. He doesn't even exist. On the TV, as it, too, comes to life with a blast of sound, sparks violently and dies. On the aquarium, as the water comes to a boil, the glass shatters, and the carpeting is flooded with a wave of steaming water and dead marine life. Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside, night. As the Japanese lanterns begin to brighten considerably, as if there's a power surge in the line, each of the bulbs begin to burst, scattering a group of screaming teenagers from beneath them. Interior, study. On Lisa, Jesse's POV. Horrified, on the desk front, as a hand comes up into frame, Freddy's hand. It scrapes up the wooden panel and grips the desktop, cutting four deep notches into the scrolled edge molding. On Lisa, she gasps. Freddy is standing in front of her. Freddy, laughing hideously, he can't fight me. Raising his eyebrows, I'm him. Freddy approaches, flashing his razor knives like a set of Tiffany rings. What? Lisa looks about the room for some escape. Freddy swings. Lisa counters by pulling an afghan from the back of one of the chairs and catching it in his blades. She reaches behind her for something to hit him with and comes up with a heavy brass lamp from the top of the desk. She smashes him over the head with it. The impact throws him back long enough for her to slip by him and run out of the study. She slams the door behind her. Freddy recovers quickly from the blow, and angry now takes after her. Interior, Lisa's house, the Paletti bedroom, night. Mr. Paletti is banging on the door and wrenching the knob. Mr. Paletti... Lisa, 
Interior, Lisa's house, foyer, night. As Lisa runs through the room, rounds the newel post of the stairway, and skids across the parquet floor to the front door. She grabs the knob and pulls, locked. Lisa, screaming for help. Jesse! Panic-stricken, she turns to run. Freddy leaps across the room at Lisa. She tries to run past him, but collides with him instead. They both go down on the waxed floor. Lisa tries to scramble away. Freddy grabs her foot and sinks his teeth into her bare calf. She screams in pain. Lisa kicks him in the head with her other foot. Freddy strikes at her leg with his talons, but she twists away and he wedges the blades deep into the oak floor. She squirms free as Freddy pulls and pulls on his weapon to unstick it from the floor. She runs toward the kitchen. Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside, night. Carrie and Hunk in the middle of the pool. The surface is choked with steam and her bodies are lobster red. They are trying to get to the stairway at the low end, but the water has become even more turbulent and much hotter in random waves, keep pushing them back, panting toward the deep end. Carrie goes under and Hunk picks her up to hold her head up above the water. Hunk, help! On the patio, several boys rush to the fence to pull down a life hook hanging there on the bracket. Other teens stand around, wondering what's happening. Interior, Lisa's house, kitchen, night. Lisa is devastatingly frightened as she crashes through the doors and quickly scans the room. She runs to the sliding glass doors leading out to the pool area and hurls aside the draperies. On the other side of the glass, five kids tug frantically or the door and bang on the glass trying to get in. Back to Lisa. She turns toward the counter and spots a wooden knife block, a good selection of gourmet cutlery. Freddy crashes into the room on Lisa, jumping toward the knives. She grabs for the thickest handle and unsheaves it from the block. This was one hell of a knife, a 14 inch long blade of carbon steel. All it needs is a blood gutter to move it from the kitchen to the battlefield. <laughs> the sliders. The five kids outside the glass doors stare aghast. Kitchen. Freddy stops in the center of the room as she swings around, holding the knife in her fist defensively. Lisa. Jesse, help! Freddy. I'm Jesse now, Lisa. He chuckles as he raises his own weapon and rhythmically clicks the blades together. He's up for a feisty victim. Lisa tries to give up the courage to send the knife home. On Freddy, his expression changes suddenly. Freddy, Jesse's voice, pleading, Kill me. Please kill me. On Lisa, she is devastated by the sound of Jesse's voice coming from within this monster. On Freddy, himself again. Freddy, mockingly. Go ahead, Lisa. Kill him. Kill him. He steps toward her and she swings with the knife. He jumps back, inches from the blade. He laughs and moves for her again. This time she swings and hits her mark driving the knife deep into Freddy's shoulder. She plunges the blade in, again and again, pushing him back across the room. The knife cuts long gashes, but they do not bleed, and with each puncture of the blade, Freddy lets out a horrible laugh. Freddy, Jesse's voice. Lisa, Lisa, I love you, I love you. Stunned, she steps back into the center of the room. She raises the knife again, but she is crying hysterically and just doesn't have it in her. Freddy catches her wrist with his bare hand and squeezes it with all his strength. 
Lisa begins quaking and her knees weaken. She closes her eyes. Lisa, tearfully, please God. She drops the knife. It sticks into the linoleum. On Freddy, he starts to mouth a parting death word but suddenly stops. Two shot, Lisa and Freddy. Lisa opens her eyes. He is still standing there, poised for the kill, but he is staring at her with an odd expression, perhaps a glint of recognition. Lisa stares back, wondering why she isn't dead yet, close on Freddy. A frown of confusion distorts his ugly face, and his lower lip quivers slightly. Suddenly, he throws her aside like a fisherman tossing... Axe, A-C-K-S, don't know what that is, an undersized flounder. Freddy as Jesse, no! <laughs> On Lisa, uh, smashing into the wall with force, she slides down to the floor, semi-conscious. Back to Freddy, he emits an agonized scream and lunges, not at her, but diving through the glass doors to the pool area. Smash cut to exterior Lisa's house, poolside, night. Reverse angle, as the glass shatters into a million shimmering pieces, and Freddy is gone, vanishing before our eyes. The pool has stopped swirling, although it continues to simmer. Carrie, Hunk, and Lifehook Boy cough and shake as they are helped out of the water and wrapped in towels by some friends. Many of the teens are huddled in little groups. Some are crying. Others just look at the remnants of the party in disbelief. Teens. What happened? Where'd he go? Etc. 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 Um... Several brave boys approach the shattered sliders with cautious curiosity. Interior, Lisa's house, upstairs hallway, night. Mr. and Mrs. Paletti listen to the uncomfortable silence. They look at the door as it unlatches with a soft snap. Wary, they don't move. Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside, night. One brave boy and the group kneels down and touches his hand on the patio, looking or some explanation for the shattered glass, or looking for some explanation for the shattered glass. On the tape deck, as the cassette pops itself in and switches on Glenn Miller, back to patio, everyone looks around, spooked. Suddenly, there is a huge ripping sound and Freddy violently crashes up through the concrete. On the kids, screaming at the sight of the monster, on the pool, as it begins to churn and boil. The razor knives fan open. Brave boy screams as Freddy swipes the knives toward his throat. Before contact, we... Cut to interior, Lisa's house, foyer, night. As Mr. Paletti scrambles down the stairs with Mrs. Paletti close behind. Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside, night. As Freddy grabs another teen and throws him into the overheated pool, he screams as he hits the water. Interior, Lisa's house, kitchen, night. On the door. As Mr. Paletti bursts through, followed by his wife. She screams when she sees Lisa groggily. He couldn't do it, Mama. Mr. Paletti looks up at the sound of the off-screen screaming. He rushes across the room to the sliders. Exterior, poolside. Total chaos has taken over. Kids are running in every direction, screaming as Freddy lashes out indiscriminately. A screaming girl is pushed into the pool by the stampeding kids and is sucked under. Two boys vault the wall. One perches on top, holding a hand out to help his girl over. Boy, come on! Freddy races at them and slashes the girl. 
She drops. Boy clambers over the wall. So did he get away? Huh. On a fleeing kid. The fleeing kid runs toward camera. No other kids in shot. As he runs, he begins to slow down, as if being held back by an invisible force. Suddenly, Freddy appears and, at normal speed, slashes the kid. Exterior, chain link fence, poolside. Several kids break for the gate. The padlock is secure. One kid grabs onto the chain link fence to climb it. The links smoke and sizzle, and the kid lets go with a scream. His hands are branded with the pattern of the steel links. Interior, Lisa's house, kitchen, night. Mr. Paletti turns white, not believing his eyes. He backs away from the sliders. Mr. Paletti, my God! He backs off some more, only taking his eyes off the scene to glance at his wife and daughter. Mr. Paletti, get her out of here! Mrs. Paletti looks back at her husband, questioningly. Mr. Paletti, urgently, get her out of here! She starts to help Lisa to her feet. Mr. Paletti turns on his heels and runs through the kitchen doors. Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside, night. Freddy stands in the center of the patio, swinging with his claw as a few do-gooders circle him and try to calm him down like he was just some ordinary homicidal maniac. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's how you would deal with homicidal maniacs. I think that's probably how you would deal with... I don't know, maybe psychopaths, which I don't think are necessarily homicidal maniacs, but what do I know? <laughs> At Freddy's feet, another hapless victim. One do-gooder who's watched too many police dramas on TV jockeys around Freddy and throws out some hostage control lines. Do-gooder, now calm down. We want to help you. Freddy displays his blades like a rabid cat, ready to strike. Freddy, help yourself, fucker. Behind them, a row of shrubs suddenly combusts. Freddy grabs him by the wrist, laughs, and swinging him around like he were throwing the hammer, sends him with a bone-splitting crash into the gas grill. The force of the impact shears the grill from its pedestal and causes a huge column of fire to shoot up into the heavens. Interior, Lisa's house, study, night. Mr. Paletti swings one of the chairs into the gun case, shattering the glass door. Exterior, Lisa's house, poolside, night. The kids are trapped inside the pool area, frozen with fear, hysterical. With the gas fire raging to one side, he screams out like an evangelist on angel dust. Freddy, you are all my children. Sound over, a shot rings out. Blowing away a dish of potato salad on a table at Freddy's side, several teens dive for cover on Mr. Paletti, standing in the frame of the shattered sliders. He is holding a pump-action shotgun as he brings the gun down to give it a second pump. Mr. Paletti, shit! He raises the weapon again, but Lisa rushes out and pushes the barrel of the gun down. Mr. Paletti fires into the patio. Mr. Paletti, furious, what are you doing? On Freddy, he looks toward the doors and makes eye contact with Lisa. Suddenly, he turns on his heels and walks, through the brick wall as if it weren't there. The very top of his head and his hat are higher than the top of the wall, and remain solid as he moves through and out the other side. There is smoke and scorch on the bricks where he passed, silence and stunned faces, frightened whimpers here and there. Mr. Paletti, where'd he go? On Lisa. 
She puts her hand to her mouth. She knows. Mrs. Paletti has come onto the patio now and joins her daughter and husband. Lisa turns and runs into the house. Mrs. Paletti, where are you going? Lisa is already gone. Mr. Paletti, calling her back. Lisa! Jesse's car, exterior, Paletti house, night. Lisa opens the door and gets into the driver's seat. Sound over. Police sirens approaching. Interior, Jesse's car. She looks at the makeshift switches and tries to remember how Jesse got the car started, I guess. I don't know the sentence, just kind of ends there. She flicks the toggle and pushes the starter button. Nothing. She remembers the two wires under the dash and twists them together. She pushes the starter button. The starter groans. It doesn't seem like it's going to start. On Lisa. Lisa, frantically. Please work. Please. The car backfires and starts. She puts it into gear and pulls out. <laughs> please work, please. <laughs> Exterior, dark highway, night. As the old falcon tears down the highway, interior, Jesse's car. Lisa is at the wheel, squinting through the darkness, trying to hold the road. Exterior, abandoned powerhouse, night. Lisa pulls up to the building and shuts the engine off. Inside, she hastily tears a strip of cloth from her shirt and ties it around the wound on her leg. She gets out of the car. She steps up to the front of the building. Her POV. The entrance is ringed by a pair of mangy wild dogs with eerie unnatural faces who growl threateningly as she approaches. She shows no fear as she steps right up to the entrance. They snap at her hands, but she doesn't pull them out of the way. They part, allowing her to pass through. Interior, powerhouse, night. Lisa walks in cautiously. The powerhouse looks fairly, I'm assuming that's supposed to be. It's F-A-R-E, but I think that's supposed to be fairly different than it did in daylight. Mysterious, dangerous, brewing, almost alive. Steam is leaking from between rusty rivets and torn gaskets, and we hear the pounding of ancient expansion tanks belching out rancid air. The interior is bathed in an electric blue light that intermittently washes pale as hot white arcs flash in distant corners of the building. She walks in deeper, carelessly touching her fingers to a large steam pipe and retracting her hand quickly from its blistering sting. She stops at the center of the room. Suddenly, a twinge of pain on her face and she looks down at her leg. Now, serious pain as she bends over and frenziedly pulls up on the makeshift bandage. On her wound, it is swarming with big black carpenter ants. She screams and brushes them away with her hands, quaking with disgust. As abruptly as they appeared, they are gone. The blood-soaked bandage is intact, covering the wound. She behacks away from the sump and begins climbing the rusted metal stairway up to the catwalk. Sound over, scraping metal. She stops midway and looks around, frightened. A few seconds to regain her courage and she steps onto the walkway. A rat, the one she met before, scurries at her. It stops, stares at her evilly, hisses unnaturally. Lisa screams. Suddenly, a cat pounces on the rat. The cat looks up at Lisa with only the tail of the rat sticking out of its mouth. Its eyes are demonic, its teeth crooked yellow fangs. It growls like a beast five times its size. The cat takes another chomp on the rat, and the rat's tail disappears down its gullet. Another angle. Lisa jumps down off the stairway onto the catwalk and starts to run. 
She clings over the steel mesh flooring. A section of the catwalk gives way beneath her feet, and Lisa plummets as if she were dropped through a trap door. Her arms flail over her head, but her hand manages to grab around a section of handrail that's still solid. Another angle. We see the catwalk is intact. It looks as if her knees just gave out, but she continues to hold on to the railing for dear life. She tests the flooring by feeling it before attempting to rise or release her grip. She rises and turns around. Freddy is there. Lisa screams. Freddy, had your chance, raising his talons. Die now. He slashes at her. She ducks and runs back toward the stairway. The stairway is red hot, smoking. Freddy closes in. Freddy, come to me, Lisa. I'm waiting for you. Lisa stops short, looks around desperately. There is nowhere to go. Lisa. Oh, God, Jesse, I know you're there. Stop him. Freddy. Jesse's dead, Lisa. Freddy's here. Freddy strikes, cutting Lisa's shoulder. Lisa screams, Jesse! Freddy closes in on her. She is trapped. Finished. Freddy smiles perversely. Want to join your little friend? Lisa, where's Jesse? Freddy, there is no Jesse. I'm Jesse now. Lisa, I want him back. Jesse, talk to me. Jesse! Freddy raises his talons for the kill. The sharp oints, O I N T S, are within an inch of her eyes. Lisa, terrified, summons up all her energy, all her might, and looks Freddy in the eye. Lisa, I love you, Jesse. Freddy stares at her, talons frozen in midair. The horrible hand quivers, as if against an unseen force. And then, the wounds on Freddy's shoulder and chest rip open. He looks down at them, surprised. They bleed real human blood. Longer angle. Lisa breaks past him and starts to run, but stops suddenly, a few paces from Freddy. She turns to look at him, leaning weakly against the railing, with an expression of confusion on his face that is almost pathetic. He touches his wounds, surprised. Lisa is no longer afraid. She's angry now. She looks him straight in the eye. His razor knives click together like they are running low on batteries. Freddy beckons her over with the knife on his index finger. Freddy, Jesse's voice. Come and get me, Lisa. Freddy laughs wickedly. Lisa moves a step toward Freddy. Lisa, I'm not afraid of you. You couldn't kill me. He's in there, and I want him back. I'm going to take him away from you, and you're going to go straight back to hell, you son of a bitch. Freddy, getting angry. Jesse's dead. I sliced him real good. Lisa moves closer to Freddy. Lisa, come back to me, Jesse. She locks her gaze on Freddy's eyes and looks right through him. Lisa, I love you, Jesse. Come back to me. Freddy, he's dead, you bitch. Freddy seems to be in a good deal of pain. He drops to one knee. Lisa moves closer. He tries to move away from her. Freddy, threateningly, I'll kill you now. Lisa, ignoring him. He can't hold you, Jesse. He's losing his grip. You can get out. Freddy, he'll die with me. She kneels beside Freddy, takes off his hat, and begins to lovingly stroke his head. 
Hmm, I wonder what that must feel like. I suppose stroking Freddy's head would be like stroking a dry pizza. <laughs> eh, which isn't something I would want to do personally. <laughs> he seems to be writhing a bit and emits several frightened moans. Freddy, he'll die with both of us. She gathers all her nerve and moves in closer. He lifts his deadly hand and presses it into her chest. She flinches in pain but continues to come in close until her mouth is almost touching his. He moves his blades onto her back, trying to push them into her flesh, but he is too weak to do much damage. Tighter angle. Locked in this strange embrace, she presses her lips against his with as much passion as she can muster and kisses him. Longer angle, Freddy and Lisa. There is a moment of quiet, then smoke starts to rise off of Freddy. He pushes her away with an excruciating scream. The sound of the pounding machinery is becoming deafening. The electric flashes are firing more rapidly and arcing across the power plant. The room is rapidly heating up. A small flame shoots along the railing. Small fires begin to break out on the catwalk around Freddy. Angle, painted surface. The paint begins to smoke and bubble with the heat, as the heat increases it into flame. On pipes, steam begins shooting up from every pipe joint. Another angle, pipes. Steam shoots out of the valves. Heavy iron valve wheels spin off their stems and roll down the flaming catwalks. On Lisa, surrounded by flames and smoke, she watches it all with fear and amazement. Close on Freddy, his flesh is starting to melt. Longer angle, Freddy, he bursts into dense, all-engulfing flame. The power plant is going crazy. The steaming, smoking, and flaming all reach their high peak. Pipes are bursting with steam, valve wheels flying off. And then everything begins to slow down, ease off. The flames are dying down around the charred corpse. And we can see it is no longer moving. The little fires around him are also dying down. And the smoke, the steam, and the deafening noise abate. On Freddy's corpse, the fires are out now. There is only some smoke, and the terrible heat has turned to cool blue light. The still smoldering corpse, with its back to us, begins to stir. Longer angle, catwalk. Lisa backs away, terrified. The corpse turns to her. It is Jesse, his clothes smoldering, his body singed and blackened with soot, but alive coming around as if it were all just a bad dream. Lisa moves to him and cradles him in her arms. Fade out. Fade in. Exterior. Walsh House. Day. A shiny new school bus rolls down the street. It pulls up by the curb near the Walsh House. Jesse, his right arm in a sling, but otherwise fresh and happy, Kisses mom goodbye at the front door. He hurries down to the bus, gets in. The doors fold shut, the gears grind, and the bus continues along its route. Interior, school bus, day. There are about a dozen kids in the bus, playing radios, having a good time, etc. Lisa, in the back, waves to Jesse and smiles. She wears a bandage on her shoulder where Freddy slashed her, and Jesse in the front smiles and waves back. Jesse makes his way down the aisle to Lisa, greeting a few kids, slapping a hand or two. On Jesse and Lisa, Jesse plops down next to her, gives her a quick kiss, puts his good arm around her. Jesse, hi. Lisa, hi. Lisa chuckles. Jesse, what's so funny? Lisa, we must look like a couple of escapees from a veteran's hospital. 
Jesse smiles and shakes his head. Jesse, I can't believe we actually... Lisa puts a finger to her mouth to cut him off. No need to tell about unpleasant things. Jesse smiles again. She's right. He kisses her. Jesse moves his head away from hers for the big kiss. Lisa's eyes are closed, ready to receive it. She opens her eyes. They are pupilless, blood-streaked, demonic. With an evil roar, a huge serpent tongue flicks out of her mouth and attacks Jesse, who screams. Exterior, desert landscape, day. The bus winds near the top end of third, all of its flashers firing wildly. It races away through the desert in a cloud of dust. Fade out. All right. That was A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge. This script wasn't half bad, despite all the grammatical errors. Screenplays are internal documents, so typos tend to occur. I felt that Chaskin tried to give us something more than just a possession story or body count flick. I think Freddy might have been using Jesse's body as a portal to the real world, where he could attack people with his dream powers while they were awake. Which makes some sense when you consider his defeat in the preceding movie. This is an interesting concept and raises the stakes far beyond Elm Street. In Nightmare 1, because Freddy is confined in the dream world, he's vulnerable to Nancy's belief in him, even though he can manipulate her dreams. The concept also validates the subtitle Freddy's Revenge, which I think got lost in production translation. It doesn't really explain why Freddy had Jesse kill Schneider or Grady, though. What didn't make much sense was how Freddy's glove kept winding up on Jesse's hand. I mean, in one scene, Jesse threw it to the floor, then in another, it was on his hand in Angela's room, and then in another, it grew out from beneath his flesh. So did Jesse secretly carry it throughout the screenplay, or was the glove part of his transformation into Freddy? Chaskin really didn't explain that. After reading this script, I got the impression that Freddy might have possessed Lisa as well. There were at least three instances in the script that suggested this, all of which were removed from the theatrical version, which is curious if you think about Nightmare 2's supposed homosexual subtext. At the end of the movie, we see that Freddy might have also possessed Carrie. If we were to see Freddy possess Lisa, would that make Freddy buy? Maybe. Maybe not. It would explain Lisa's belief in Jesse's claims and interest in Nancy's diary. I don't think Freddy's comment of having waited five years for Jesse meant much of anything. He also could have waited X amount of time for Lisa, Carrie, or whomever. Maybe Freddy preferred Jesse. Speaking of Carrie, I appreciate how the filmmakers developed her character. In this script, she was little more than a non-entity, like the Patty character who appeared once and never again. But in Nightmare 2, she seems to be a person with some substance, an individual who wants to feel good, somebody who's snobby but also kind of compassionate. Is Carrie's demeanor a facade for having dreamt of Freddy? The last thing I want to mention is I think Chaskin tried to implement as Robert England put it, their precognitive nightmare approach, which wasn't all that effective. At the end of Nightmare 1, we see Glenn's car carry a panicky Nancy and her friends away, and at the beginning, the same car and people arrive at the school, with the jump ropers appearing in both scenes. So you may ask yourself, did everything up to the end actually happen, or did Nancy just dream they happened? Although Jesse dreamt of his doom in this script, he was a different person with two random girls on the school bus with him. Did Freddy possess the bus driver? Was everything in the breakfast chapter and beyond a kind of near death experience? Was that why Jesse looked different in the beginning? You tell me. <laughs> well, this concludes my video. Thank you for watching and or listening. I'm open to more read-throughs if you like. 
Have a nice day and don't stop actually reading. Bye now.